movement you've all been waiting for has arrived yeah world (laughs) podcasting championships we have a very special guest mr bronze age pervert welcome to red scare (laughs) yes it's very special thank you thank you so much for having me on honor it's an honor to be on red scare podcast and uh i was walking today on street uh Mm -hmm. completely uh I haven't eaten for two days. I have starvation psychosis. Please forgive. Yes. Are you in ketosis yet? I guess you always become on ketosis whenever uh, you are fasting. But uh, I'm not sure if that if it interrupts it when you uh, drink alcohol, you know. Um, I'm, uh, I, I'm a, I've just started a bottle of champagne. I hope that's okay. Of course. I was going to ask what you were drinking. Can you can you tell the listeners what you're smoking? We're smoking American spirits and drinking a chilled red. And I'm vaping. Yeah. I am smoking co- Cohiba clubs. These are, uh, you know, they're it's slightly aged tobacco. It's uh, it gives a big brain boost. I yeah. Are you fasting for spiritual purposes? <laughs> no, it's it's just a regular cut, but there's always a spiritual purpose. Uh, if you've seen uh, Hemingway book, Movable Feast, he talks about going to museums and how the colors become so much more vivid when you're hungry. Uh, I believe in this. I believe in caloric restriction. But we shouldn't talk nutrition on this show. No? Why not? Why not? Uh, I was gonna have, I we have to a lot you, of anorexic yeah. <laughs> and bulimic fans who might be inspired by your talk of caloric restriction. Well, okay, we can talk nutrition if you want. It's just uh, I, I am sometimes confused with the uh, type of people who talk about nutrition, fitness, and so on, even though actually I, I almost never do that. Well, I wanted to ask you about Ray Pete. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're a fan of Ray Pete. Yeah, but Ray Pete is mentally ill. Let me put it that way. I mean, <laughs> Ray Pete Rest in peace. is he's a wonderful man. He has grand ideas about physiology. He's one of the only people to talk about human biology in terms of systems. Uh, what is the purpose of hormones in terms of regulating entire systems of the human body? Yeah, and he was very important for me in part. Uh, in, I mentioned him in book and so on, but um, he's mentally ill. He's a weirdo who lives in Mexico. And, well, he's, uh, dead. He's, he's dead. He's dead. He died. Well, uh, yes, I know, but he's, you know, I don't, I don't talk about people like that as if they're dead. Oh, okay, I, okay. Uh, but, but he's, uh, for example, if <laughs> somebody tells you not, uh, <laughs> not, not to eat uh, avocados or um, yeah. not, to, not to eat berries because they have seeds. I think uh, the true Peters also don't eat fish roe because they have... Because it's oxidized. Yeah. R- r- right, which, by the way, um, most fish supplements probably are oxidized if you buy cheap ones. They're yeah, rancid, they're, rancid, they're, rancid, yeah. they're poisonous. Um, now I hear that you can't um, eat bananas anymore because that's unleftist <laughs> and exploitative for the farm workers of the global south. Yeah, did you yes, catch me in the ban- banana discourse? Yes, I don't have any opinion on this. It's a big thing now with fair trade, right? But it's been for a while. You're, uh, I, I don't think you should eat bananas in general because... They have uh, bad effects on what? your bowels. Yes, I, it, it's said to have bad effects on your gut flora and uh, many other things. Mm. Uh, plantains are fine and uh, they're just pure starch. And then green banana, green banana flour is the best prebiotic. It, um, it's food for good bacteria, supposedly. Now, hold on. What is a prebiotic versus a probiotic? <laughs> That's like a, a proto-fascist. Pro- <laughs> Yeah, a probiotic is friendly bacteria, which again I can go into high detail about if you want me to. No, it's um, okay. Uh, it's it's um, although I think it's somewhat misunderstood because what matters is a certain balance of so, uh, good and so-called bad bacteria in the uh-huh. gut. Mm-hmm. Pre- prebiotics are things that good bacteria like to eat. So, for example, cold potatoes or green banana flour are certain kinds of starches that. Um, good supposedly bacteria love. Um, mm-hmm. I, I strong recommend you and your uh, audience try the Osfortis uh, BioGaia brand a probiotic, which is 
a strain of Lactobacillus reteri that has actually changes how people behave toward you. And everyone, I know that sounds strange, but everyone I've uh, asked to try this uh, reports same. First of all, you feel euphoria after about a month of using it continually, and it changes how people behave toward you. Uh, it's, uh, there are numerous studies that shows... Uh, they this, feel this better. Because you're giving off different vibes. Yeah. You're more confident and assertive. It's that or it's some other mechanism like pheromones. Nobody knows yet. But, um, there but you are many, find people uh, are drawn to you when you take this probiotic. Yeah. Yes, and it's good for both men and women. For men, it's actually, there are many studies that it um, uh, raises testosterone, but um, this company is a reputable Swedish company and they don't want to be lumped in with, you know, testosterone boosters, which are perceived as these kind of uh, low-class bodybuilder type uh, supplements. Mm. And so so they don't say anything about, they market it as it's good for women and bones. Like the, um, the testosterone booster is is, the rice kernel sized um, <laughs> microchip that they shoot into your butt. What? Like I bi- don't know. Biote. I got one of those to about boost a year your ago tea? because my T levels were incredibly low after the baby. Oh, right. Yeah. And it, it certainly made me more aggressive and unlikable, but I don't know if it had any long term effect. Is that what it does for women? I don't know. I think, for example, older men become shrill and unpleasant and mean because they're, they're low testosterone. I mean, if you look mm. at the low, lowest testosterone uh, type people, the, the stereotype of the old hag, right? That's not entirely mm-hmm. a pleasant person, you know? Right. No, but I always assumed that that was because of um, too much estrogen. Though yes. I guess too little testosterone would produce the same effect. I, I can't. It's know. hard to know. But I'm, how do you? Uh, yeah. um, how does a guy like you go about um, uh, identifying and researching which companies of like probiotics and supplements are reputable? It's just people talk a lot, and a reputation builds over time. So BioGaia, this. Swedish company who their story it's very funny they say they found this particular strain of L. Roteri from the breast milk of a Peruvian woman <laughs> now I don't, I don't buy that st- like how who what? goes randomly looking yeah who goes randomly looking in the uh, mountains in the high Andes of Peru well, at uh, breast milk to see what like what the flora is and they find this unusual strain with all these properties I don't know crazier weird things sex happened. perverts yeah when you think of um the breast milk of Peruvian women, you think of those like fermented, fully preserved mummies that they find in child sacrifices. But actually, it's like a woman who works in like a bra making factory and her body is like filled with microplastics. <laughs> it's, yeah, these, uh, Peru is one of the. She has like minions physique. Yeah, she's yes, a perfect no, square. <laughs> Peruvians, though, I have to say, there's a new class of um, panhandlers on the NYC subways that I've mm. discussed with Dasha and other friends. Um, these little Peruvian uh, mommies who have their little <laughs> ninos strapped in like an Aztec wrap on their backs and mm-hmm. they're selling candy. And that used to be um, the domain of black teens who pretended that they were like fundraising for their quote basketball team, but were probably <laughs> just pocketing all the funds. Yes. And it's, it's very sad. It actually makes me want to be a leftist when I see like young women and babies like panhandling well, on the subway. Well, they should start selling their breast milk because yeah, it's should, full yeah. of amazing probiotics. <laughs> but I have to say the Peruvians have very noble profiles. Um, some of them have Roman noses the way some mm-hmm. Japanese do. Um, and there are even claims that the Inca or whoever lived there before the Inca traveled across the Pacific to Japan. But um, uh, just to go back for a moment, if you would let me spurg out so-called yes. on the on the repeat, it's, because it's you mentioned estrogen. It's your time estrogen. to shine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you mentioned estrogen. And um, so repeat, I think, is the least useful when it comes to giving you complete dietary advice. The people who actually follow... <laughs> com- <laughs> okay. uh, oh, yes, no. Pe- you tell us oh, now fuck. after we've been peeing for... <laughs> Well, you should not be like the people who, if you go on repeat forums, it's people who want are 80 pounds to and have orange raise skin. their metabolism, right? And because mm-hmm. that's the, the whole peat thing, uh, up your metabolism. Mm-hmm. And so they start eating 
tons of sugar and sugar-like things, and they just become obese. They're constantly... <laughs> no, I mean, these are people who are constantly taking their temperature throughout the day, like every 15 minutes, and yeah. like eating tons of sugar, and they become obese. Um, at most, his dietary advice can help, like, say, a menopausal, so, you know, a woman who's 50 or 60 and has been eating seed oils and trash. and he, But his insights, however, are quite solid. For example, you mentioned estrogen. It's, estrogen is not the female hormone, and that's one thing that he traces out in a very convincing way. It right. was never seen as the female hormone. hormone. Yes, it's a stress hormone. It was rebranded as a female hormone by the chemical industry because coincidentally, most chemical runoff and pollution is estrogenic. And so mm -hmm. they don't want to say that it's a stress hormone that leads to uncontrolled replication of cells because it's that's literally cancer. It's the cancer hormone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's also the growth hormone, right? If you don't have estrogen, you die. You, you need some, but it's just, the modern world is so, for whatever reason, incredibly estrogenic. And so in these kinds of insights, he, uh, nobody else is like him. He's very useful. But in mm -hmm. particular advice, you should not, I don't know about uh, avocados. Uh, do you Avoc like avocados? Of course avocados What's are good for avocados? you. It's healthy fats. I like avocado. I, I will not stop eating it. But there are theories that the giant sloth of the Americas, which was this, uh, you, you know what the sloth is. It's this kind of uh, animal. animal. It's lazy. It, yes, it's cute. It's lazy. It, uh, they actually have big claws. Be it's careful. They're slow. They're slow, but that's they're part of the ecosystem. Yeah, they live in trees. There used to be giant sloths, though. And there are theories that the giant sloth... Um, was exterminated or self-exterminated by becoming addicted to avocados. Mm. They have a, yeah, they have addictive properties. I think I don't know, but avocados. Well, that explains why um, all the liberal millennials are obsessed with like avocado toast <laughs> <laughs> and consume well, it in large quantities because they have addictive personalities and poor impulse control. I like the hipster trends. I like avocado toast. I like hipster coffee. I think it's one of the few good things to come out recently out of yes. so-called... Uh, yeah. One of the um, salutary beneficial effects of Globo Homo is that you can really like parachute yourself into virtually any city in the world and eat well. Anywhere, yeah. And the cuisine is like standardized and refined, but it's good. Whereas you didn't know in the past if you could necessarily find anything to eat in many of these places. Yeah, now you can just go to Sweet Green. Yes. In, in some cases, it's been uh, an overall improvement. Uh, Argentina, for example, has some good things like good steak and some other, but it, overall it's a terrible local cuisine the food the the coffee was awful mm -hmm. but uh after uh, cultural colonization by brooklyn <laughs> where uh now they have good avocado toast and good you know hipster coffee everywhere so that's nice um what other uh millennial hipster trends do you like <laughs> I don't know. You ask me particular ones. I, I, nothing comes to mind now. I mean, uh, what do you want me to say? They are supposedly, uh, suppose, they're supposedly they're asexual, but that, uh, what is there to like in that? It doesn't lead to any product, uh, any, you well, know. Well, well, they're not, polyamorous. Too. Yeah, they're polyamorous, which mm. is, which is even worse. A kind of asexual. Because they're asexual with weird, annoying social rules and strictures. Um, but speaking of Argentina, I have a question for you. Yes. I've been like dying to ask. So you're like famously a big Spain head. Uh huh. You love Spanish culture and cuisine and whatever. Um, but you're yeah. also famously a friend of the animal. So uh, bullfighting. Yeah. Mm. How that make you feel? <laughs> it makes me feel good because without bullfighting, that a very ancient breed of bull would not have been preserved. It would have died out. It died out everywhere else. Um, and they, uh, those bulls, yes, the spectacle seems gory and so on. Although, you know, I find it, I find it titillating. We can talk about that if you want, but, um, the, uh, the bull itself uh, lives a very good life compared, for example, to, uh, feet, to cattle that people eat from a supermarket uh -huh. that, that bull grows up in something called the uh, Dehesa. It's in the Southwest of Spain. 
you can drive through it. It's kind of, it looks kind of like African savanna, but it's oak trees and other trees and herbs. It's where the Iberico pork also grows. Oh, yeah. it's, it's kind of this idyllic environment for an animal to grow up in and those bulls grow big and strong in that Mm -hmm. in that and live very good lives and then they have this glorious death i would want to die that way i i want a glorious and erotic death like that yeah, I think, I think for women and other femoids their deaths are very uh, tragic have you been to a bullfight no, but I some I've been to many Morrissey concerts, and when he plays "Me Is Murder," he screens oh. all this really gory factory farm footage, and then he also screens the bullfights, and they're of a different caliber. They really are apples and oranges. The other thing I wanted to ask you is, where do you stand on the hierarchy of olive oils? Because there's this common wisdom that Italian mm-hmm. olive oil is is the best, but I prefer <laughs> always like Spanish and Greek olive oil. Yeah, yeah, no, Italian olive oil, as everyone knows by now, is mostly fake. Um, the kind that gets exported <laughs> is sometimes actually rebottled Greek olive oil. Other times it's just simply not olive oil at all. In Italy, if you serve olive oil that's fake in a restaurant, you go to jail. But they have no regulations for export. So uh, I'm not saying all Smart. Italian olive oil. Yes, um, I'm sure the high the high quality brands Italian olive oil are fine, but you you have to research that. The only real olive oil that you can get 100 percent is American and Chilean because they have incredibly strong regulations on on selling fake olive oil. Um, but if you go to Italy itself or to Spain itself, I would agree with you. I think Spanish olive oil is the best. They have. Um, just very wide variety of, of olives with different tastes and so on and the, the low acidity. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Um, I know you like to eat five guys. Do you ever eat McDonald's? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I, yeah, my, my go to, <laughs> uh, my, uh, my go to fast food is Shake Shack. If I can have it, I, it was in Tokyo and it, it was, usually much better than the gourmet burgers in Tokyo. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Five Guys is a good replacement. But oh. yeah, I've, I've, I've been to McDonald's. Um, never, it never makes me feel good. Um, <laughs> there's, there's something, I get the quarter pounder uh, double or whatever with cheese. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I'm is that told- called in France? A royale uh, with yeah. cheese. Yeah. Anna, come on. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, you're making fun of me because of the Tarantino not. movie. I, no, I, I do not. No, I'm not. No, she's I'm not. not she's fun. literally so just paranoid. I have not. I have not gone Gemini. to. Uh, <laughs> I have not been to France in a while. So, but from according to Qu- uh, Quentin Tarantino movie, it's uh, Royale or something. That's um, a famous Pulp Fiction. Um, wait, I have another question. When they kill the bull in the bullfighting, yeah, they do eat the meat, correct? I don't think I, so. I, don't I think that would be. I, I'm curious because you know when like an animal dies under stressful and strenuous circumstances, it like releases like toxins or something into its bloodstream. And I watched a really illuminating <laughs> episode of uh, Anthony Bourdain, No Reservations. Which, by the way, yeah. Bap, if you ever choose to self dox, you should just do an Anthony Bourdain type travel, travel culinary show. show. Yeah. But anyway, um, <laughs> it was, I watched the Croatia episode in honor of our friend Nicolo <laughs> and they were, um, <laughs> they went to a, a tuna farm somewhere off the coast of Croatia where um, the, the bluefin tuna or whatever, that's like a delicacy everywhere, especially in Japan is imported all across the world. And they have this very involved method of killing the tuna that involves spearing the brain through the eye so that it can't release the toxins yes. mm-hmm. so that the meat is not corrupted or polluted or whatever. That makes sense. Um, when they dispatch the bull, it's with a clean cut through the back of the neck, I think. Um, okay. I, I wouldn't think they eat it. Um, I strongly encourage if you ever run into Spanish um, ox, uh, or or bull, uh, you know, toro. Um, I don't know if that's the ox or the or the the, the ox is the castrated one. The bull is not. Mm. Um, uh, if you ever encounter that chorizo made from toro, you should have that. <laughs> it's it's very tasty. But 
Um, yeah, I don't like food with whatever those things are. And in fact, um, if you've ever eaten unpleasant meat, it's usually from an uncastrated animal, but that's, that's a different thing. Um, look, I don't know. Now, now you're going into very dark territory because I hear the, I, I hear the pedophile elites, the, the, the yes. demonic Babylonian conspiracy for thousands of years that have always preyed and eaten children, according to the dissident right and the brain trust coming out of uh, yeah. Alex Jones. Well, the adrenochrome. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the parts, the, the, yeah. Uh, yes, apparently it's the opposite. They want to uh, increase stress and torture so that, the, you know, and then they eat the flesh. They so harness the fear. Yes, yes. It's not just yeah. about eating the flesh. It's about the, yeah, when the children that they originally <laughs> sacrifice <laughs> experience fear that fuels them. But I think yeah. when, you, when you kill a bull in like a... a a, a glorious death match in a Roman style arena that's different, I guess, than like I went to a bullfight in Mexico. Like small <laughs> and crushed animals in like a factory farm. Wait, when did you go to a bullfight in Mexico? What when I fuck? was a teenager in, Can <laughs> in Cancun. <laughs> How that make you feel? It was dark. It definitely was not like classy. Not it was really movies, weird. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, but I bet it's different in Spain. I bet it hits Here's another question. When you eat like five guys or Shake Shack or whatever, do you like immediately rush home and have like a tablespoon of coconut oil or what? Or you just go with the flow? Yeah, that's another uh, good uh, rapey insight. A way to counter the seed oils in basically any restaurant food. And almost every restaurant, including very good ones, will be food, full of seed oils um you know the nice yeah. vegetables you see may have been resting in a brine with um you know canola oil so yes you should have coconut oil because it acts in the body as an analog of uh, vitamin e and it somewhat counteracts the bad effects of seed oils but you could also take a multivitamin that has a good um source of vitamin e so yes, I do. I do do that. But you know, honestly, I think it's it's a bit overblown the the seed oils thing. I knew very healthy people uh, online who who thought seed oils were fine, and um, these these kinds of dietary over concerns. I'm so I eat, uh, a, I eat yeah. seed oil all the time. Yeah, you have to as a Russian um, person. When <laughs> I tell you that the Riga gold sardines are packaged in olive oil. In rape wrong, seed oil. Yeah. Oh, in rape like the oil. oil. <laughs> yes, I'm a fan of Riga gold. And if you mm. like to frequent Russian stores, um, you should you should have the Kabarovskaya ikra. Do you like the red ikra? The ikra krasnaya yeah, is my yes, favorite Russian course. food. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Russians have been eating ikra for centuries. Look how they turned yes. out. Like, ugly <laughs> and fat and bloated. They really hit the wall. Um, what do you think of Russian people? Do you think yeah. there's any credence to this, like, common wisdom that uh, they're cynical and nihilistic? I think they are... Uh, on one hand, I should disclaimer, I love Russian literature. It's my favorite. I love Russian music, uh, classical music. And in general, I get along with Russian people. But the especially right wing online is quite um, delusional about them. They are boorish. Uh, for the most part, Russia is Africa. Um, mm. As Wh my White friend Africa. Hakan says, mm -hmm. well, I, as my friend uh, Hakan says, uh, Slavs are hairy, smelly apes, you know, and um, so, and uh, also Russian women, and no offense to the two of you, uh, because you're not fully Russian, um, but when an American man uh, oh. marries a Russian woman, he usually doesn't know what he's getting into, and they eat him up completely because... Um, they're, they're just not what there. people think. Yeah, yeah. that's um, good. That's good advice. I'm Russian. Yeah, Dasha's like <laughs> fully Russian. I'm actually significantly more Russian than people think I am, like to the tune of like 36, 37 percent. People don't believe me when I say that, but it's true. Well, OK, so I have a question for you about you've said Slavs, but isn't Slavic like a very broad ethnic category? Uh, yes, but there are, there are very many common things running through from the Czech. Well, the Czechs are actually an exception. I'm happy to talk about the Czechs. They are bisexual, you know. Um, <laughs> but the rest of the Slavs are, uh, yeah, they're different, but they're similar to each other. Um, 
Uh, I'm happy to talk about the bull, by the way. Uh, the bull? I don't want to. I don't want to uh, retread. I don't want to retread co- uh, topics if you don't. But 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 really, this thing about the death of the bull. Um, wh- He's really shook uh, about <laughs> the bulls. <laughs> well, because what is the assumption in in criticizing the bullfight? The only thing I disagree with uh, is if the bull wins, if he kills the matador, he should be allowed to to go free. But mm, otherwise, he should be pardoned. Uh, yeah. A uh, violent death is is much preferred, in my opinion, because, like the Vikings uh, said, a bed death—that's what they call it—a straw death, a, a death where a you a lesbian uh, death, uh, <laughs> you know, where you die in a hospital or in in the uh, ancient equivalent on a straw bed. That was seen as the most dishonorable thing, a death, a violent death in war. That is how you are reborn with the full measure of the will, or even intensified, and so. Uh, no, I disagree with the uh, with the idea that uh, you know I, I, I'm against um, mistreatment of animals in industry, farm, industrial uh, farming, and so on. But uh, a bull, a bull's death in in, in the matador thing is is t- something yeah, you're, totally different. Yeah, you're making you're making some points. What happens if you die a bad death? You're reborn into like a lesser form. You are <laughs> you are re- you're reborn with less. Uh, intensity of being, less intensity of will, yes. Uh, Schopenhauer actually describes this uh, from the opposite point of view because he, uh, you know, for him, life is uh, a teaching, uh, a learning opportunity to to learn that existence is not worth it. And so after many <laughs> life, after many lifetimes, you, you know, you, you realize uh, that, that uh, life isn't worth it. And so you experience, uh, I'm, I'm simplifying yeah. here. It's, yeah. it's, well, uh, you experience nirvana, but uh, the, the pagan ancient view was exactly the opposite, you know. And so, uh, you know, like a death in suicide of the right type, like uh, Mishima did or Seneca and, uh, or any other ancient uh, noble Romans who died by suicide. That was a way to be reborn in a more intensified version of yourself. I could believe that. I Now that I started reading Nietzsche last night, I suffer from convert syndrome. So I'm going to speak uh, with <laughs> confidence and authoritatively about things I don't know about. But Anna's one of the different things, now. yeah, I'm not like the other girls. I'm a 40 year old <laughs> virgin who read Nietzsche for the first time. Um, one of his beefs with Schopenhauer is that he has this very like pessimistic doomer view of reality. Right. Yeah. But can I just segue back um, to the to the, bull. <laughs> to the No, not to the bull. I can't talk about the bull anymore. No, no, no. The, the Russian question, because I have uh, yes. a minor bone to pick with you about yes. your, your anecdote about the Moldovan <laughs> Jew. <laughs> yeah, Go, yeah. yeah, he goes to a black owned crab shack and he like wows <laughs> all the country folk with his like voracious appetite for catfish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And um, a Twitter user West Western made this into a very iconic clip. But you said, I think maybe on Caribbean rhythms, that Russian Jews are basically the same thing as African Americans. But yeah. I think that you might be wrong because it's not Russian Jews, it's Russians in general. And I think, like, um, <laughs> if you happen to encounter Russians, in a place like the tri-state area or New England, Massachusetts, they're all going to be um, immigrants from that first wave of post-wall immigration. So they're going to be Jewish. Yeah. You don't really encounter many pure Slavoid Russians in these areas until now. So yeah. do you think it's possible that you were mistaken in <laughs> classifying Russian Jews yes. and not all Russians as essentially African American. I, I think you're right. I think that's true. It's just that um, Russian Jews tend to be high IQ but very low impulse control, and so the analogy becomes very humorous and striking. Like no impulse control and uh, um, violent desires, but who's high IQ with a and Jewish that, mind. But, but what I'm <laughs> yeah. saying is that that's a more Russian than Jewish yeah. quality. Yeah. The, the low, low impulse, the low control. impulse control. Yeah, and yeah, like the gambling addiction yeah. and the alcoholism, the paternal absenteeism. <laughs> you know, and you asked me about Slavs, but that's for Bulgaria too, in the sense, what's Bulgarian family values? It's a guy in, in, a, in a dirty tank top hitting his wife on the yeah. head with a shovel, <laughs> you know. And so, yeah, uh, but Russians 
probably are are the pure form of that. Sure, I I agree. Which is something you said uh, before um, that um, I think you had a tweet on this. Uh, I'm not really with the uh, HBD uh, neo reaction right. Right. In mm. uh, the the Hanania types, especially in attacking uh, blacks because of their low impulse control and criminality, I think those are uh, good traits. Actually, so you know. So BAP is coming out as an anti-racist <laughs> on Red Scare podcast. I, I, I am an anti-racist, and I had an anti-racist post recently about Lenny Riefenstahl, which I'm happy to talk about. But um, it's, oh, not yes. that, it's not that I think uh, being a criminal is that good, <laughs> but, but that being against that, being against that, the way a large portion of the right is, including Steve Saylor, who I love, by the way. He's we the love best Steve journal- Saylor and that, yeah. I, that pic he posted of himself as a young the, boy the on picture? Christmas. Oh, my God. Of Steve mm. as a boy. That gave me baby fever all over again. Spoiled Steve. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> when when did he? I did not see this. What happened? Like today. He posted <laughs> a really cute baby picture of himself on Christmas. That's that's nice. No, I did not. See, I want to see. But, I met Steve Saylor. He, I don't know if he knew who I was. He's a wonderful guy, and he's the best journalist in the United States for the last I think t- so 10, too, yeah. 10, 20 years at least, by far. No, no doubt. But... I don't agree with his general take on the world, which is similar to Hanania's. I'm happy to talk about this. Uh, you um, called Hanania and Sailor and their ilk IQ clerks. Within that realm of knowledge, there's a big spectrum of, like, there are people who are, like, wild and free, like Steve Sailor, and then there are people who are, like, <laughs> bean counters, such as Hanania. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But even so, I think like a, a guy like Hanania does bring a lot to the table. Ugh, come on, Anna. And also, I, I really actually, <laughs> when I think about it, I resent this like consensus that he's like horribly ugly. He because is actually, horribly ugly. No, if you ugly. actually look at him, he has those piercing baby blues and, and overcast eyebrows of like, oh, no. no, hold on, of, of an adorable toddler. Oh, but you, uh, t- tell the people he does the not truth. have monotonous yeah. features. He's he looks, not. He looks like a Fayum portrait, you guys. I'm an art Anna, historian. She, I you're being at, contrarian. Uh, you know, you like Gainsbourg. I, you think he's handsome. He's I mean, hot. He's, no, no, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Let's be he generous. Does, I wouldn't Hanania go so not, far as to call oof. Hanania handsome. But he has a, a certain uh, childlike wonderment in his eyes. That's generous. That, that almost redeems him aesthetically. I've never attacked Hanania for for what he looks like, and he has some good tweets. That you know, yeah, would, let's, would talk about, let's talk let's about let's talk crime. about crime. So Rab Amari, no. you guys should know. You have a gigantic audience. I talk to people uh, from from all walks of life who who listen to you uh, at so called highest levels. Uh, American society, they they love you. Um, people who are not online, people who old friends who I got back in touch with recently. They they listen to you. So whenever Can we you talk about people them? like, <laughs> did I wa- did I what? Can you dox them? Tell here? us later. No, no, <laughs> Can you, tell I want to know. Tell us in no, private. <laughs> no, no, but for example, I'll tell you in private. But for example, uh, private counsel for X company that is one of the hugest in the world, and not just one, but that iterated many times love loves you and so your audience is you know it's 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 uh maybe we don't have an audience as big as tucker but people who listen to us are you know uh important so-called people right and whenever you talk about particular names like the one we just said we're boosting them um sorry for the tangent but basically what i mean to say i'm just using that name as an example of a big tendency among some are, some are my friends, the neo reaction people. I don't like the world they come out of um, in this focus on crime and black crime. And I can, yes, I'm happy to talk that if you want. Uh, um, yeah, I, well, I have mm. a, a question about black crime. Mm-hmm. Mm. Obama's personal chef. Oh. What's your What's your theory there? Was he a down low brother or? <laughs> O- Obama is obviously gay. Uh, Rahm Emanuel is 100% gay. I know from a guy who was on his floor in college, Rahm Emanuel was carrying on a gay, if I may say, 
I heard this. I don't. I can't verify if it's true. I know maybe you need me to say that, but no, no, this no, guy okay. claims this guy claims 100% Rahm Emanuel was carrying on a gay relationship with a local congressman Barack or senator. Uh, no, Rahm Emanuel, and Rahm Emanuel has always been a huge. Uh, homo, everybody knew. Now, Barack Obama, you know the rumors about him with Man's World and that, and I believe that he has, uh, he has very strong gay vibes of... He's you just know, we a can Leo. Talk this. Come on. It's called I being an, a male attention whore. I believe I buy it. I, Look, all those guys are, uh, are gay for pay, which in the <laughs> contemporary world means gay for clout and attention. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. I, I know I know a Brazilian rent boy who's gay for pay, who's who's a Leo. I did not know that was a Leo. That was a Leo. Uh, but that that makes sense. Uh, do I know what Obama is in his heart? How he identifies? Whatever. It doesn't matter. CIA. The church, mm-hmm. the church that he met um, Michael Obama in. <laughs> Um, uh, Jeremiah Wright. That's the guy. That's the that's the church, right? It yeah. was a well-known church in Chicago for pairing so-called difficult women or whatever Michelle is with gay <laughs> down-low brother men like like Obongo, and so uh, and and that was just well known. That was the profile of that church. And by the way, by the way, that is also the profile of the so-called dissident right online. If you want, we can talk that later too. It's, yeah. Um, it, it, the coalition of so-called difficult women uh, with a, um, a closet case. Uh, neurotics like Obongo uh, is uh, makes a huge portion of especially the new dissident right um, that came into 2017 and replaced the older so-called frogs who are who are just people who want to have fun and 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 uh, you know you, you know we're into humor and funny and so on. But anyway, I can I can talk if you would like the thing about about black crime and and um um i listened to delicious tacos episode recently with mm. you and i you began it that way right <laughs> the, 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 the the famous 1352 uh yes uh thing right. uh he was doing some become, improv yeah mm-hmm. well well i mean delicious tacos doesn't mean that he's he's no, that's he's, not his focus he's the biggest um anti-racist and feminist because he's a libtard for pussy and probably also just a regular libtard and we love him for that i mean my my um philosophy that which i pilfered from champ miss robian um is that when you become successful enough you've earned the right to be a libtard that's what we're all striving (laughs) for and i actually don't think delicious tacos is on that level yet but will manifest that for him yeah well i don't see it as anti-racism i i just have a different uh i i think the excessive focus on that particular aspect leads to much worse things so for example well well yes this is the thing uh the people who attack uh blacks for that aspect and they could be attacked for other things which I I think a a political criticism of blacks, because, for example, any ancient uh, thinker would see America's black population as one uh, in stasis, this word stasis from ancient political philosophy, which means uh, in revolt. They are in a condition of revolt, but they are actually a political nullity in almost any country that they've been... uh, whatever demographic of in history, they are not a political actor. They're very, very easy to, um, I don't want to say subdue, that's rude, but they are very, they're actually a very docile population. If you look at the American South, the whites in the American South after the Civil War were in some cases very, very far outnumbered, and they were an occupied population. The the Yankees occupied them, right? But the American whites very easily through political organization retook their territories and 
the this other population we're talking now i'm sorry if i have to talk in code i know it's very docile when you look in Pretty africa code itself we're getting banned <laughs> yes oh my well, god but, uh, <laughs> no excuse me it's a sociological anthropological thing that um, major anthropologists like pierre van den Berge have talked about you look at rwanda right rwanda is ruled by people who look sort of like somalis they are uh cattle herders who came from north from the north not north, not quite north africa but from the north they're co- so called nilotics these are the tutsis they've always been a minority they've uh-huh. easily easily ruled a hutu which is bantu population which in africa is understood to have uh, the qualities that peasants all over the world have they're extroverted they are not very uh bright if whatever I, they're I, I, soulful I don't be but real. you can you can make they're, that they're connection soulful. with with slavoid surf populations uh, who are also yes. very docile i think like elitist russians are very fond of saying that um slavs are are slaves that they're docile and easily subjugated hmm. I, I think uh yes i think that analogy works but uh, but this population you know russians um i don't know if you can compare in this sense whatever the cause may be maybe it's the russian elite but russians rule 11 time zones right uh edward lutvak after the crimea thing happened that was 2014 or 13 i think 2014 when putin took over crimea and that unlike the current ukraine mess that was a professionally done russian historical operation where Lutvak looked at that and gave a speech after and said, you know, this is why the Russians rule 11 time zones, because they took territory and they divided their enemies. In the wake of the Russian takeover of Crimea, which was bloodless, Europe and America started fighting among each other. You know, you don't find in Africa that type of behavior. So I don't know who in Russia is doing that, if it's the serf population or some a hereditary elite that... It's the Michelings. It's the Michelings. Yeah, it's going to be the Michelings uh, century, sure. (laughs) Um, Whoever's doing that, you don't find that in Africa. My point is that the the blacks are not as such a political threat. They become a so-called problem in under conditions of mass democracy. And um, the focus on crime and on so-called low IQ and so on, which isn't, I believe it's not really even what the problem is with this population. The focus on that, the implicit uh, alternative presented by people like we just named, the neo-reaction people, the, right. the human, yeah. human biodiversity people, is um, something I've called IQ nationalism. It's an exaggeration, but they think IQ and docility and uh, things like uh, ability to work in an office are just uh, the most wonderful thing. Unfortunately, Steve Saylor has some of these same aspects. He believes that the medieval, let's say, shopkeeper or the engineer is the basis of Western civilization. I think it's a an enormous distortion of of history and of human yes. greatness to believe that. And, but Steve um, Saylor is... is um you know, a chill SoCal dad with a perfectly manicured lawn. So, you know, why would he he think otherwise? But there's been a lot of attempts throughout um, recent American history to turn black people into a political class or even a revolutionary subject. I was going to bring this yes. question to Chris Rufo, and I still will. But Rufo, as others before him have pointed out e- even more eloquently, people like Tom Wolfe and Joan Didion, that any attempts to radicalize this population, the minority population has essentially failed because they failed to develop a political consciousness, which is, you know, understandable in their right. I will be glad to give you numerous examples from Africa itself and the decolonization history, for example, in the Portuguese empire. Of course, it's failed. I'm sorry, with all due respect to this population, and they have their virtues, they're good at music and some athletics and so on, but they've never ruled and never will be able. And in whenever, for example, there was a revolt against European rule in Africa, it wasn't them who took over. It was a kind of mulatto minority supported by the Soviet Union or China. 
And it's the same in the United States. It's other people using them as props. And uh, I'm very much against being manipulated into, um, oh, um, I can't say the word on, on your <laughs> show. Uh, 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 oh, we're right wing, so we constantly need to, to chimp and get mad at the uh, b****. All right, I, I'm very much against that. And again, the implicit... Uh, alternatives supported by people like Hanania or the neo-reaction people yes. or the, the it's that we should support um an IQ so-called meritocracy but mm -hmm. my opinion is that a Han uh and I don't say Chinese because I actually like the Cantonese people and the Hong Kongers but let's say a north uh whatever the, the, whatever the demographic weight of China is that a Han and Pen Heavy, you know, heavy. Am I allowed to say that? Um, am I allowed to say that a uh, so-called meritocracy in the United States yeah. is is something that's going to be far worse and far more cruel than this other thing that people are complaining about now because of BLM? You and sound so like on. my mother. Yes. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, Anna feels a real kinship with you because you remind I do, her so much of her. Exactly yeah, I, I, I know. I'm, I'm like your mother. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but why? Mm -hmm. Besides the IQ, then the you think the focus on crime then is seen as like a corollary to IQ it's differentials. A cor yeah, it's, it's a like the flip side, right? And also, it's the psychological origin of where a lot of this comes out of, which I'm I'm very much against. Which is a very sensitive subject. Again, feel free to uh, to cut me off, or if you want to edit it out. But um, basically, a lot of these people, like Hanania, their origin story is they were robbed by blacks on the street or intimidated by blacks in the past in some kind of social situation. And so with that chip on their shoulder... They laugh it, at you, oh, the black teenagers. They'll, yeah. they'll yeah. laugh at you. There's no experience more humbling than being laughed, laughed at, at black it. teenagers for uh, yes. having an overly long cigarette, <laughs> which you may, say, you may say that they will never rule, but they do rule now. The streets well, on, I, in New York, at least. Yeah. Well, yeah, New York, New York is a is just a just a weird case. Like um, we are told that the United States is this hyper capitalist thing ruled by neoliberal cynical elites who have tight tight control on everything, and we live in a kind of Elysium where they. Um, you know, they don't have an orbital station quite yet, like in the movie Elysium, but they secretly control everything and they are promoting these tumults for cynical, uh, self-interested power reasons. But yeah. they've lost control of their own city in New York, right? I mean, Yeah, they, and I think <laughs> it's, it's beneficial for both sides to sustain this narrative. And you have like guys like Andrew Tate and Tucker Carlson now making the point that... Um, racism exists to divide the poor because <laughs> there's like this overclass of elite technocrat pedophiles or whatever. But I do think these like crime and IQ narratives are fundamentally bad because as Ray Pete would say, they're inflammatory. <laughs> yes. What means? What do you mean inflammatory? Like they ratchet they up people's, people's yeah. like uh, stress and anxiety levels. And they're also like, you know, I'm going to say a very anti-racist thing. They're kind of like false on the ground. How? How come? How come? I, I, you know, I don't live. I have the luxury not to live around many of these dysfunctions. I, well, I travel all around. And so I live on the cusp of a black neighborhood and a Chinese neighborhood. And on the whole, people are very nice. Anna, your and neighborhood is awful. It's awful. It's, it's, <laughs> it's loud and crime ridden. <laughs> <laughs> but on the whole, the people that you Your encounter on the street are, are, are in my very heart. Nice. And they course, love the baby. Most people are all the, all the homeless people mm -hmm. on the block know the baby. That's sweet. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yes. Well, if they if the locals know you and vouch for you, then you are mostly protected. Which is another uh, point of evidence to that it's a political problem. It's not. As such, what the HPD people, the human biodiversity people and neo-reaction people, they want to make it out that it's innate to a black dysfunction to be criminal and so on. I believe it's a political problem. I live part of the year in a place that is majority black 
and there is street crime and so on. That too is political, though. And um, on the other hand, in certain neighborhoods, they completely do not touch you because they're terrified that if they do, the local security services will destroy and crush their family. I, I'm um, loving this um, new mm-hmm. softer anti-racist side <laughs> of path that we're bringing out uh, on Red Scare podcast. Uh, it's it's not actually well uh, because so I'm racist. being listened to. Uh, unfortunately, there's a spotlight shined on me now, and so I cannot say fully what I, what I would like to mean. But it's not quite anti-racist. If you dig into what I'm saying, um, it it goes into another direction. But we well, you're pro, it, you're pro crime. Have you have you um, heard of the documentarian Lewis Thoreau? Yes, of course. How do you feel about him? I don't I don't I don't watch his things. I know he did some okay. ex- expose documentary on the so-called alt right and on that, the that was, he did one on on the uh quote carceral system in the US which was very yes. interesting and illuminating. Uh yes, um I I don't know it. I am interested more in the documentary made by Errol Morris uh about Fred Leuchter and uh, I, I don't know if you know Errol Morris. We uh, do. Of course, it's, yeah. Yes, it's well, uh, famously uh, refused to come on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he refused. Why did he? Ref- why? Why? Why he refused? Nah, I think he was just busy. I think. Yeah, busy. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't mean to change the subject. You ask me anything. Uh, ask me anything you want about that. But uh, Errol Morris, I, I, I'm happy to talk about this documentary too. That he did. You know, Fred Leuchter was. Uh, a guy who who went to Auschwitz and claimed to find certain things. I'm happy to talk that to oh, uh, who, who uh, through the power of <laughs> autism uh, <laughs> came to the conclusion that the Holocaust was not real. I remember this guy, yeah. Well, I, I have no opinion on the evidence he presented or not, but I just found yes, it funny that... Um, well, uh, maybe, but um, <laughs> I, 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 I find it funny that er- Errol Morris was showing all these guys saying, and he went into holy of holies and he committed sacrilege and blasphemy. And see, mm-hmm. that's what activates my, uh, yeah, I want to jizz all over the face of people who talk like that. You right. See. Mm-hmm. right. Well, okay. I have a, I have a question. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, don't be offended, but, um, yes. Why, because I don't even mean you really, but why do so many autistic guys love <laughs> Hitler? <laughs> mm. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that they're autistic, uh, but... No? Um, well, well, some are. There are so I don't mean like, obviously there's Nazis that aren't autistic, but a lot of... Mm, enthusiastic, let's say, like <laughs> Hitler is. Yes, yes, yes. Or yes, yes. like there's obviously... Like a big yeah. Why do demo- they love him? Yeah. Why do why like what do the autists know about World War Two that we don't? Well, they but, do study a lot of maps and exactly. Stats. I know it's like part of it's they're into history, blah blah. Well, sure. I, I would turn that around on you and ask you why Hitler is the Satan of the modern world, even after what is it, seventy, eighty years of, uh, and he is still the obsession of the left now. It, it's always well because and, and he not, exterminated uh, five point five million Jews. Well, well, but so did uh, Hitler, uh, excuse me, Stalin exter- and Mao exterminated more people. Right. Um, why? And it's not just the left. It's the neocon right. It's Bill Kristol right. and these kinds mm-hmm. of people who who kind of talk like this guy's Hitler, that guy's Hitler. Every 10 years, there's a reincarnation of Hitler. It's mm-hmm. Putin, then it's Trump, then it's uh, before that it's Saddam. Um, why has he become? He is the protagonist. He's the protagonist of the modern world. Um, he's been made into this by the left and by the uh, stuffed shirt uh, establishment authorities for, and we can talk about why that is. And I would say the, what you call the autists, they like him for similar reasons. He, unlike the other mass murderers I mentioned, has, is a man of some kind of mystical, enormous charisma. It's the aesthetics that are associated with it. It's the aspiration to greatness that doesn't exist as much in Mao and Stalin, who, you know, I'm very happy to talk this too, the difference between the Marxist end vision of mankind versus this other one you're bringing mm-hmm. it up, uh, yes. you're bringing up now. And so that's why he, he is 
um, maybe the entire post-war morality and political system of the world is created in the Nuremberg trials and the president, they said, is is built on a rejection of what Hitler was. So it's okay. it's become this kind of disfigured thing. Uh, I, I'm happy to spurg out all you want about this. Why? Okay. Well, so what you're saying mm-hmm. is that Hitler was a grandiose narcissist, so all these covert <laughs> narcissists secretly envy him. Uh, it's, it's that. It's also um, why did Susan Sontag write her insane article about fascist aesthetics, about Leni Riefenstahl mm. doing a study on the Nuba, this African, uh, this, this, I think they're South Sudan. Great uh, photo Sudanese series, tribe. by the way. Yeah. Uh, yes, and I posted this. This was my great anti-racist contribution to, to tell the... Uh, the National Review guys that they're inferior to the Nuba. But, um, you know, why in response to that did Susan Sontag write this? Because what Susan Sontag wrote, it's not that she introduced this idea and corrupted everybody's mind. She just expressed what the left and liberal mainstream after 1945 has felt that human strength and beauty and power are evil and need to be excised from human existence. And that logic has driven the left for the last since whatever the end of World War II is. And so I don't know, does this answer your question? It's well, I have a of- lot of thoughts on this, but uh, before we get into that, I want to point out that Susan Sontag is uh, an interesting intellectual because um She has had more uh, official and unofficial biographies written about her than virtually anybody else. And the portrait that emerges is of a person who was basically humorless and defensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, my... Beef and she's Susan not into Sontag, rock, as, she as well. Alia says. <laughs> yeah, she was not into rock. And, you know, my my personal beef with Susan Sontag has nothing to do with Polly, though I, I take Polly aside in their beef. Um, it has to do with the fact that she introduced my favorite writer, Alberto Moravia, at the 92nd Street Y and acted all like pressed and depressed that she had to do it. And then <laughs> in, in, in backstage when they were all like partying afterward, she made a snide remark about him being a, a lesser writer than other Italian writers of the time because he was not sufficiently like experimental and surrealistic and to like not appreciate probably the greatest living writer of your time who's standing there right under your nose is like a really great act of covert narcissist hubris in my opinion mm-hmm. that really brought a tear to my eye yes i i know i don't read her i know her from paglia's criticisms of her which sound right i love paglia and i you know i know you guys like her too and i i take her word for it you know have you ever read moravia i have not you got to no, do it I- he's he's billed as like the famous anti-fascist writer of italy because he was sort of purged from writing by Mussolini and came back to it decades later, but he's probably uh, the best judge of like human character, the best artist of psychodrama before Welbeck came on the scene. Yes, I must read him. And I actually, I want to talk to you about Welbeck, but may I ask you, Mm -hmm. I know this is not Caribbean rhythms and such, and you don't take normally take breaks, but we are about, an hour into yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, we can take a break. Would, would you mind if we take a five-minute break? No, no. Um, and, and before that, I would just like to uh, go back a moment to what we were talking about regarding the neo-reaction and human biodiversity. The image they have for the future of America of a so-called meritocratic elite uh, that I will not say names, but that is run by these um, or has a high percentage of these peoples from, let's say, East Asia or South Asia. And I would ask you if you have had a recent encounter with customer service, (laughs) um, with any large company, and the hell that that means, and the fact that words don't mean anything, that um, rational communication is impossible, Mm -hmm. and that that is the future of the so-called meritocracy in America. The judiciary will be run the same way. Um, everyone I've talked to, I, you know, uh, I'm a 
I, I'm whatever. I don't work. I don't. But people, <laughs> but, but people who do, who run, who have to deal with this, uh, tell me the same. It's completely sociopathic and unethical. And they have made a mockery, actually, out of the very concept of meritocracy, not only by cheating, which is a huge tradition under the Mandarin system of uh, testing that existed in China for thousands of years and that has been now transferred to the United States, but uh, just in general in their in their day-to-day dealings, um, what, what the effects are with this recent, for example, affirmative action ruling by Supreme Court, why... why did affirmative action become so bad? It was not because of the blacks. The blacks were always, let's, let's take the uh, elite so-called universities. The blacks were always 8 to 10% of this. And it was kind of a quota. Everybody accepted it. I didn't like it. Uh, good people couldn't get in because of this. Uh, it was unjust, but it was contained. Um, the problem really was with the with the with the Chinese, if I may say, admissions committees in universities yeah. noticed two things, that Chinese students, after they graduated, they became ophthalmologists in upstate New York or something like that, and they also never donated back. And so they said, yes, these people get good scores, they get good grades, but is that really what the meritocracy or what the opening up of these universities in the 1950s and 60s was about. It was not about that. It was about why did the universities, the WASP universities, open up? Because Feynman, people like that, the famous physicist Feynman, couldn't get into the university he wanted. That was perceived as an injustice, and it was. And so they said, we want more Feynmans. But what you're getting now in this new crop of, let's say, newcomers and model minorities is people who, again, become an ophthalmologist somewhere. They do not contribute anything in class. They're silent. They often cheat. And so actually the corruption uh, of meritocracy does not come from the blacks. It comes from the so-called model minorities. And that's why meritocracy was abandoned. And once it was abandoned, universities said, well, if we abandon meritocracy, we might as well make everything race-based. And this is something that, that is forgotten and that is promoted by these other people we've been talking about. I'm sorry to spurg on this. No, uh, no. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We probably have to cut this part. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. All right. All right. Well, let's let's take a break. Uh, yeah. Take a break. Yes. Let's let's go to a smoke break. Let's go take there a break. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, which parts of Nietzsche are you reading? What have you been reading on Nietzsche? Um. So I read his preface to uh, the Birth of Tragedy, and. An attempt at self-criticism? Yes, an attempt at self-criticism. And I read I read some aphorisms from Human All to Human. Is that the correct title? And then I, I yes. started on the um, genealogy of morals because our friend Second City Bureaucrat recommended that I go with that one first. And yes, Dasha, Dasha recommended Eke Homo, but I don't know. I'm like truly such a novice. It's actually quite remarkable that I've gone this long in life without yeah, how I, have I'm you like not you with driving. <laughs> <laughs> the genealogy of morals is amazing. It's one of the most right wing books I've written and it's resold in universities as Nietzsche's left-wing book, if you can believe that, but um, nobody actually reads it. They only read things about the genealogy of morals. Right. But it's mm-hmm. it's um, it's a great place to start. And Nietzsche, as a psychologist, of course, that's what he loved. He loved Dostoevsky as a psychologist. He loved Larouche Foucault and Lichtenberg as psychologists. He is the prime psychologist, far beyond Freud, I think. Um, and I think but, Freud accepted uh, this, right? He he basically paid homage. He to was Nietzsche. a massive influence. The, the on interesting Freud. thing about um, reading Nietzsche for the first time in my advanced age is that um, you realize that you've derived a lot of the stuff that Nietzsche says independently, which is not due to the strength of your own intellect, but due to the fact that um, 
ambiently, indirectly, you've come in contact with it through like the culture at large. Because well, you've read through, Bronze Age Mindset. Because you've read Bronze Age <laughs> Mindset three times, which is mentally <laughs> ill. Bronze Age Mindset is like my good fellow. <laughs> <laughs> and Bap, by the way, I give this book out like stalking stuffers. Well, I I am honored, and I don't. I am humble, unlike other so-called writers and people who fancy themselves philosophers and theorists, which I would never call myself. I'm happy to say I'm just a popularizer of Nietzsche because I've felt since I was 16. I first ran into Nietzsche. I was 16 years old. I read some of these same books you're talking about now. It made me very angry at first. I was actually a hardcore Marxist at. 16, not a um, mainline Marxist, I uh, like a, a platonic Marx, you know, there, there's communism in Plato and so on. And it made me very angry at first, Nietzsche, but then seduced me slowly. And he's a very seductive writer. And um, I have always felt he is a prophet of modern world and includes nobody since him has managed to exceed him. And the people who have tried, like Heidegger and Leo Strauss, and then there have been quite a few others throughout 20th century who thought they could criticize and exceed Nietzsche. And their criticisms are, are always, I think, pathetic. And um, we live in the age of Nietzsche in the way that, let's say, people after Plato at some point, after some centuries after Plato, because his, his influence uh, creeped along, uh -huh. lived, in the age, lived in the age of Plato. You know, Christianity is, is the age of Plato. And so it, it's absurd to try to to fight against him. I'm happy to be his popularizer. Uh, I don't pretend to be anything more than a popularizer of Nietzsche and a shit poster and humble internet, uh, you know, shit poster online. That's all. Do you um, think um, uh, Nietzsche would indict you for your false humility? Well, okay, l let me ask you this because <laughs> one of Nietzsche's good aphorisms that I read was that um, honest books are good if nothing else, because they bring out the anger and aversion of like lower, more petty minds. And what's that quote that we've like said on the pod that was said by some prominent historical figure that I can't remember now <laughs> yeah. that like foolish if you're not a leftist when you're young. Yeah, something. if you're a... Yes. No, what's the yes. quote? You, you're like, do do, you're, do if... any of you drunk retards okay, remember the okay, quote? Okay. If you're... <laughs> you're heartless. You're heartless if you're not a shit lib when you're young and you're brainless if you're not a conservative when right, you're old. Yes, but, yes, but, so yes. why but are I, so many young people drawn to Marxism? Why has everybody gone through a Marxist? I don't think I ever went through a Marxist phase in spite of my affiliations, my associations, but that's also because I'm a profoundly literal and unimaginative and never thought to rebel against my father. Yes, uh, I, I can try answer that, but I should say I disagree with that common phrase that you had me just say right now, because <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm not a conservative. I never pretended that I was. I don't get along with conservatives. And I want to talk to you on this uh, episode about this problem of the conservatives versus the avant-garde right and so on. It uh -huh. actually very much relates to Nietzsche because Nietzsche is right-wing, so-called, but he's not conservative. And in fact, the word right-wing, I prefer not to use it because it's so much misunderstood in, a, in an American context. What does right-wing mean? Um, I had a professor from New York, I forget her name, she was on Twitter, she threw a fit when I just mentioned something that everyone in Europe knows, which is that Nietzsche was right wing. And she's like, well, how can he be right wing? Because he criticizes capitalism and he <laughs> criticizes the bourgeois. And it's like, yeah. really, that's, that's your view of right wing that like, it's just like Republican versus Democrat. That's what you see. So I don't even like the word right wing because it's so misunderstood. Um, but um, yes, sorry, what were you asking just now about a Marxist phase? Why does everybody in youth cycle through a Marxist phase? I, I think I think it's the love of war and radicalism and that that's just the most uh, culturally acceptable source of radicalism after 1945. Yeah, if you're like a young person who's at all dissatisfied with like an establishment... That's the most accessible way of accessing and, you know, a revolutionary fervor and all of that. And why yeah. do certain people remain leftists and others? Because they don't have no the brains. So 
<laughs> they have the, they yeah, lie. like they don't have no brains, like Dasha said. Yes, I believe this. Um, it, look, but, is this actually, but then is this a psychological and constitutional problem? It, I'm afraid. The thing that I'm most afraid of uh, is that leftism as a whole is a biological phenomenon corresponding to a predominant type in modernity yes, um, and that it's it's that it's not just something that you can argue people out of i think there are leftists even in even adults who by inertia or for status reasons so called for social approval reasons have remained leftists uh, but in youth i think what was just said is is true it's young people love war they love violence they love energy and they love shoplifting <laughs> they love shoplifting. There's a perception that Marxism is a rebellion against the established order, and it's helped along by Soviet anthems like, um, uh, what is it called, uh, Red Army, uh, Black Baron, or something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like this incredibly militant music. I've used it on my show. It's it's wonderful, but it's got nothing to do with Marxism as such. It's just militant music in the Marxist end state. And this is what I hope to convince leftists of, uh, I mean, sincere ones, genuine ones who could be convinced that the Marxist end state is a, is a hell of boredom. If you look at what Marx says about what his ideal world is, where you fish in the morning and you paint in the evening, it's a nursing home. It's nothing. It sounds like um, being uh, like a Gore Vidal type figure on the Amalfi Coast who writes for okay. like four hours in the morning and then has lunch with his friends and then goes cruising for uh, rough trade right. and so on. Well, I have Nietzsche a question says, for... Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> no, yeah, he says, like, they want that there should not be anything anymore to be afraid of. They want this, like, placid yes. kind of existence. Safetyism. Right. And they want to eliminate suffering as if that was ever, like, the point. And so here's a question for the both of you guys. What do you think of Walter Kaufman? Because I think he attempted <laughs> to really rescue Nietzsche from all these charges of like misogyny and anti-Semitism, which I don't know that Nietzsche himself would have wanted. Um, was he like self-cucking to the academic establishment and therefore taking Nietzsche down with him? Or was this an act of... Uh, misguided munificence because he wanted to free Nietzsche from these like long housers and allow him to be read on his own terms. Yes. Uh, uh, do you want me to answer that first or uh, sure. Dasha, do you want to answer that? Well, yes. well I've only, the, my, my follow-up question is only like, how would that, depending on what you think, influence also his translations? Because I've actually only really read Kaufman, except maybe like alternate translations of Zarathustra, but I've only really read the Kaufman Nietzsche. In general, the Kaufman translations as such, like word to word, are generally okay. Uh, he makes, I think, some mistakes. So for example, Gewalt mention actually means a, vi a violent, you know, when Nietzsche says Gewalt mentioned their culture, a violent man of culture, um, Kaufman really mistranslates that. And then other distortions especially show up in his commentary, in his introduction, in his footnotes, and so on. I think um, Kaufman was probably one of these types who was semi, at least half well-intentioned. Um, yeah, Nietzsche, you cannot blame Nazism entirely on Nietzsche, and so he's right in that sense. But overall, I think it has much to do uh, with what we um, brought up earlier on this show, what the nature of the avant-garde is, what's happening on the internet since, let's say, 2010 and before. Because uh, Kaufman uh, ended up being very bad, I think. Uh, his, his project was very bad. And I encourage people to search. I, I can post this. Um, a friend of mine, Nostromo, he wrote a two- or three-part essay on Kaufman's distortions of Nietzsche. That, mm -hmm. As far as I'm aware, he's the only one to have done this. On um, Substack or what? Uh, I, I, th I, think, I think it's on Substack. I'll, I'll post it. And, is and Nostromo if you the mathematician guy? Excuse me, is he the what? The mathematician. He's not, mm. I, I, I don't know what he is in personal life, but he wrote a very 
detailed takedown of Kaufman. Uh, I don't like Kaufman because if you look at what's happened at Nietzsche since World War II, before World War II, 1900 to 1940, Nietzsche was at, uh, he was perceived correctly as a right-wing philosopher and the head of the vanguard of the artistic right wing in Europe. Um, and then after he was neutered and because something like the internet did not exist, because media control was centralized in, well, all over the world, but in, in Europe and the United States specifically, um, the way it worked is the universities taught Nietzsche because they couldn't excise him. It, it's very funny. There's this parallel thing that Machiavelli says about um, Christianity and the Latin language. He says that Christianity probably would have preferred to get rid entirely of the Latin language the same way they tore down statues and closed all the ancient oracles and the Olympic Games and so on. But they couldn't do that because of the ubiquity. Uh, there, was, there was Latin literature everywhere. They, were, they had to write in it. They had to la write in Latin and Greek. Mm -hmm. And so they had to preserve it. They couldn't get around that. And it's something similar with Nietzsche. He was so powerful uh, influence on so many writers, musicians, even uh, all kinds of artists, painters, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Giorgio uh, de Chirico just understood himself and his project entirely in terms of Nietzsche. That's just one guy. And, and uh, they couldn't get rid of him. And so they had to preserve him somehow. So the way they preserved him is within the university system. Uh -huh. They taught an entirely distorted version of Nietzsche where he was um, presented as this ironic, joking, anti-nationalist and anti-Nazi and anti, uh, you know, anti-anti-Semitic and an these other kind of things, um, which are all have truths. And anybody who stepped outside of that and said what Nietzsche really was never got, you know, you could say that maybe in a university thesis, but you could never get outside that to the general public. You could never put it in an article, in a, anything else. The most you could do is maybe make a movie on such themes, which, for example, um, I think The Shield uh, actually is a, a great... <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great Nietzschean series for a pop culture, you yes. know, mm -hmm. Nietzschean mindset. But beyond that, it was very hard to break through. Then the internet comes along and the lockdown on information that's available to the general public breaks down. And Nietzscheanism, that's my thing and some of my friends, it's not the main, uh, you know, there are many other kinds of what, what I call frog, which is just really young people in the 2000s, 2010s, getting fed up with stuffed shirt idiots in uh, establishment authorities, telling them what they can think, what they can say. Nietzscheanism is just one strain of forbidden thought that was allowed to come through because of the, um, because of the internet and so on. Uh, I am uh, quite drunk, so I actually forget the initial question of how we got here. Yeah, Kaufman. Kaufman oh, yeah, was, yeah. Uh, unfortunately... Kaufman was one, unfortunately, yes, he quote unquote rehabilitated Nietzsche, but he was also the main vehicle in the Anglo world of this distortion of Nietzsche, which is, it's completely fake. Um, I mean. But is there an alternate translator? Uh, no, 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 no. We have to learn uh, German. Uh, uh, yeah. No, and, and Hollingdale is fine. And Kaufman is actually a good translator, is better than others. Um, you know, uh, he does but, seem like a uh, nice guy. Bap, did you read Nietzsche in, in the original German? No, I do not. I do not. No, my, my knowledge of German is very rudimentary uh, to my shame. But um, so, but how do you know the that notes with Kaufman? If if you if you if you are really diligently like reading Nietzsche, then the footnotes are you're all they're laughable. You know. No, no, no the, the Kaufman, the Kaufman notes can be ignored. His translations, even Nostromo, who is a this frog I named an anonymous account who wrote a criticism of Kaufman, even he says I think that Kaufman's actual, um, excuse me, translations are are generally fine. By the way, there's a huge amount of Nietzsche that is untranslated, letters and many other notes that has recently 
even been discovered. So um, oh, hopefully it will soon be. <laughs> yes, yes, it'll hopefully soon be translated. You know. And, you know what really mm. inflames my suicidal ideation mm. is the knowledge that I can't possibly read all this shit I want to get through before I die. So I may as well end it all ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> You've reached a Schopenhauerian conclusion. <laughs> it is. It's very. Sh- I don't. I'm not proud of that. But it's true. <laughs> well, I'm happy then never to have read most of so-called philosophers after 1950. I pretended to, but I never did read them. I uh, There's so much, you know, uh, yes, just the whole work of Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, which I focused on. But besides them, nobody reads anymore La Rochefoucauld or Lichtenberg, who are other people that these two I just named, Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, respect. Uh, you know, you could probably have La Rochefoucauld's books and or Montaigne, and they Is outweigh. That uh, <laughs> uh, no, not Foucault. La Rochefoucauld, uh, 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 yes, yeah, seventeenth-century f- uh, French psychologist that Nietzsche highly praises, and they probably outweigh in insight anything written after nineteen fifty. You know, so. Well, we have a, a friend called Matthew Malouf who translated our Welbeck episode, so I'm sure he's familiar with this guy, and we can have him give us like the keynote talking points yeah Yeah. but my my point is like like Kaufman was obviously attracted to Nietzsche for sympathetic well-intentioned reasons so I have to think that his um, errors perversions or whatever were well-meaning at the end of the day and I mean but but he is like a lot of watershed figures who by virtue of of making a stamp on society, and I guess he did that like peripherally by associating himself with Nietzsche, uh, are the beginning of the end. Yes, he he may have been well meaning, but you know Kaufman in the end is a historical footnote. Who cares about him? Um, he's a translator. Uh, yeah. I'm more concerned with what Nietzsche meant before, let's say, 1940, when he could be read without these heavily politicized um, filters after 1945. And when you look at that time, um, you may have noticed recent attacks, both on me and on you, and tying us together as um uh, i don't i don't want to say his name we kind of made it easy for them whose name yes Uh, there's this uh recent attack on the avant-garde uh so-called you know the so-called dime dime square new york arts phenomenon the downtown Um, fascist avant-garde yeah yeah, but this this (laughs) i have to fall on the sword for this because this is basically all my fault because in 2020 (laughs) i read your book after much urging and from various like right wing and ons who probably <laughs> understood that I was sympathetic to your mission. And, or, you know, it actually took me a long time to read your book. I was really stalling because I figured it would be like another like irony poisoned online pilled like work of meme craft. Yeah. And I, I do mean what I said on Twitter many years ago that it's, it's like, you know, equivalent to like a, a Welbeck or a Brad Easton Ellis in our time. But it is true that like there is, an, uh, you know, a certain association, but also these people, like you have to be disabused of, you know, what they are, which is like people who are like apple bobbing for clicks and clout. They are, and they're really petty uh, midgets and dwarves since few days after my book came out, it did well from the beginning. And I had these guys, I don't want to say their names, and I don't want to say the names of the recent guys who are attacking the so-called fascist avant-garde. But they were like, they wrote um, a book report, basically, on Deleuze, who, mm-hmm. which they called which they called a book. And it didn't do well, predictably. And <laughs> so uh, then they look at my book, which is on the surface, just this vulgar, raucous, uh, uh, online shitposting. And they're like, well, uh, I don't like that this uh, vulgar thing is getting attention. How come I, I'm an important intellectual? I'm an intellectual. <laughs> How, well, I'm a serious thinker with capital S. Why am I not getting attention? And so obviously this must be a psychological operation. And so, you know, Teal is obviously buying books from this guy and money laundering to him through buying fake books or whatever. And it's been this since basically I published it more than five years ago. And now it's 
because you know uh, you guys like it and others like it and it's spread beyond what I thought it would. It's gotten these, again, intellectual midgets who imagine themselves great thinkers to attack me and attack you and attack this burgeoning art scene, which as far as I understand, it's just people who like to create beautiful things who don't want to be moralized and i hear from entirely well, don't give them parallel that much credit. <laughs> well uh, you know i i don't know but i no, I, I hear think, from yeah. um the uh, verso guy did call the dime square scene small and curdled people trading on transgression <laughs> for attention <laughs> which i are doing enjoyed. like the service of proto we don't have fascist. a serious political project <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's not about a serious political project. I, I don't believe it's, it's that time is gone. There's no serious political projects now. Um, there could be an aesthetic project. But, but, but it's very uh, interesting because there seems to be no end to this like spate of hit pieces. And they always take two forms, which is yes. like the one where they problematize the work of Nietzsche or Junger or Evola or one of these uh, other historical figures coded as uh, fascist or proto-fascist yes. as a means of basically getting around mentioning you directly by name, yeah. even though it's really code for you. Because the sad reality is that none of these new journalists are really interested in any of these writings. They don't read them. Yeah. They, they read nothing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then, like, uh, the... the um, I mean, there have been, like, some, like, straightforward ones by, like, uh, Blake Smith. Is that his name at The Baffler? Yeah, and yeah. Rosie Gray, who, you know, <laughs> her article was fine, except for the last few paragraphs where she attempted to, like, associate you with... Like, mass shooter? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And then the other one is is obviously like the, the, the kind of format of the scene report, which argues that um, the uh, ideas of these dangerous thinkers such as BAP or Mencius Moldbug or Delicious Tacos are spreading like <laughs> wildfire through the Dime Square scene, all of whom are too stupid to realize that they're spreading... Proto fascism. Yeah, they're foot soldiers of proto fascism. But I feel even bad. Like, I guess I feel bad talking about this because I think it becomes like a self reinforcing feedback loop where yeah. everyone is promoting everybody else and contributing yes. to this completely like fake meme discourse. I don't know. I see it as like them doing a kind of PR. <laughs> yeah. They, or all press is good. Press. Yeah, there are unpaid <laughs> PR agents. Yeah. But how do you how do you feel about Don't you feel like this makes <laughs> like it like sucks your energy and it distracts you from your vision and by miring you in this like petty cycle of spin? Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's bad and it's uh just a way for me to um humor my own laziness and i should <laughs> i i should ignore it i have a second book planned that i haven't written yet i should ignore all this all these types of things i i mean uh they show something about the so-called modern intellectual that actually my friend city bureaucrat has this wonderful article your, your audience should look up called um uh, ideologies of delayed informatization, which yes. I, I, which is about precisely this kind of intellectual who seeks a pat on the head from the establishment, so-called intelligentsia, and the way they think they get that is by denouncing these vulgar sophists like me, like you, and so on, who are spreading dangerous ideas in society. Let me just say something about, and it's not merely self-protective, about so-called fascism. Fascism is a non starter today it's not it doesn't there's no prospect for it there's no prospect for any nazi party there's no prospect for any fascist party uh if you take the whole online far right whatever you want to call it it's at most 70 i would say that's a, a high estimate 70,000 people worldwide it's my it's significantly less than that it's not enough i to thought run. you were gonna say 70 people but <laughs> It's probably, well, 70, no, it might be 700 or 7,000, but 70,000 is the upper limit, I would say. It's not enough to run a party, even in a European country with proportional parliamentary representation. It's enough, however, to change 
culture to change uh, um, ideas and so forth. And that's where its strength could maybe lie. On top of that, uh, my own focus, um, a friend of mine said, was, uh, I took it as a great compliment. He said, you improve on Nietzsche because uh, Nietzsche had hopes that his ideas could be done through a state system, that they could be achieved through a statist system. And the whole fascist so-called or whatever Nazi you want to say project in the early 20th century was, was very statist, it was state-based. I, I don't have... And it's not, again, merely even, uh, I'm not saying this to protect myself. I don't have any political or state-based ambitions at all because I'm not stupid. It can't be done anything that way. Uh, all I've done is taken the core, as I see it, of the idea of Nietzsche and mixed it with my reading of antiquity of ancient, certain ancient Greek philosophers. And um, I am trying, I guess, to... Uh, bring to people's minds some truths forgotten and suppressed by modern propaganda. Uh, that said, that said, these people that you're talking about, uh, the midgets attacking us in these, in these pieces, um, they make a mistake. They think wrongly that the avant-garde, so-called, is a fundamentally left-wing phenomenon. But the truth, if right. you look, if you look before 1950, especially, is very much the opposite. Most of the great artistic literary names before 1950 were men of the right or of the hard right. You could mention Celine; he's very prominent in mm -hmm. this. The, you know, the big names are Celine, Younger, Mishima, and so on. But there are many, many others. Dostoevsky is, by any modern definition, a hard rightist, um, and. Even people like Proust or Musil, great uh, novelists of the past, uh, Conrad, right? Conrad, what is Conrad? Conrad, in his own time, was... <laughs> uh, uh, you laugh at me. Okay. No, Conrad, no, 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 yeah, no. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm laughing at myself because uh, uh, yeah. The Heart of Darkness Anna just was, Heart of Dark. was famously Rerad. on all, like, middle school, high school curricula in the United States for a while. Yes. I don't think it is anymore, but I just reread it. Right. I saw your tweets. They're, yeah. they're great. He, he, he's no longer read because of Edward Said book, Orientalism, which, which I've is never all, read, but it is on this uh, bookshelf. I've read it. <laughs> um, no, Sa Said is just a Foucauldian, a Foucault, a Seath at Conrad, yes. a man who wrote wonderful, vivid cinematic novels that somebody like Said could never write. He's not the only one who's seething at him. There are reasons... Well, which are fundamentally morally ambiguous. Anyway, sorry, I interrupted you. Yes. No, I'm sorry to rant, but uh, there are modern, like, I don't know if Ibram Kendi, but some other uh, intellectual midget or cripple, uh, cripplet, like mental cripplet, like uh, Ibram Kendi, was also seething at Conrad recently. They never stopped seething at Conrad because what was Conrad? He was a Polish guy. English was his third language. He wrote English better than the English. He has these amazing novels about his travels in very colorful, mm. vivid um, uh, colonial, if you want to call it that, but in, in the uh, tropical world and so on. Mm -hmm. And he, in his own time, may have been a quote-unquote pessimistic liberal, right? But today he is the devil. Today he's a fascist devil to the far left. And what was Conrad? He was a disciple very openly of Schopenhauer. Mm -hmm. um, Tol Tolstoy understood, at least at the end of his life, his own work in the in terms of Schopenhauer, he thought Schopenhauer was the final philosophy of mankind. Uh -huh. Wagner was the same. I Wagner mean, I think come a Tolstoy's greatest novel is not War and Peace or Anna Karenina. It's, uh, are those Tolstoy novels? Did I cite that yeah. correctly? Yeah, yeah. Fuck. Yeah, you're um, doing great. Um, <laughs> it's Haji Murad, which promotes a very pessimistic Schopenhauerian vision of reality and human relations. I'm happy to talk details of Tolstoy, but just in the general trend of his time, um, D.H. Lawrence, uh, Tolstoy, uh, many others understood themselves as e either Schopenhauerian or Nietzschean, which uh, they were both hard right uh, philosophers and these disciples of theirs are the same. 
And so the whole European avant-garde, uh, Giorgio De Chirico, who I know you mentioned on the show where you discussed my book, and I'm happy to talk about him. He also literally understood himself as a reincarnation of the spirit that was inside Nietzsche. Okay. And, and this whole movement, let's say 1890 to 1940 in Europe, the avant-garde artistic movement, was politically on the whole very much a hard right movement. Okay, so I want to ask maybe for like a working definition of hard right. Yeah, and how right, that applies right. to like guys like Nietzsche and Schopenhauer who may not have been understood as hard right, right in their in, times. And it's in somewhat a, confusing. And like right. in contrast to, you know, the modern sure con- mainstream right or whatever. Yeah, because you I think people it. now look at somebody like Andrew Tate or Tucker Carlson <laughs> and think they're hard right. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's 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 pathetic. And of course, before that, they looked at George Bush and thought he was he was Hitler, right? Yeah. And so, b- by the way, not that I support Hitler, but Hitler, <laughs> Hitler carried a copy of Schopenhauer's World as Will and Representation in World War One in his knapsack. Um, whereas other German soldiers were just by rote signed a copy of Nietzsche's uh, Zarathustra uh, mm-hmm. in their knapsack in World War I. Um, but um, yes, it's very different. It's very different, which is why I don't like the word right wing, because it's got nothing to do with, let's say, Rush Limbaugh or the Republican Party's platform of um, flag, uh, cross country, family. But uh, when you say uh, pl- a, right wing, a hard right philosopher, what do you mean? I mean that they saw uh, human life as fundamentally hierarchical and um, opposed to what we talked about earlier, the Marxist vision of a completely homogenized, universal, egalitarian state where people go... Uh, you know, fishing in the morning, uh, painting at night uh, f- f- for no particular reason. Um, whereas this this other vision of man saw him saw saw mankind as maybe a transitional state between uh, something lower and something higher. Let me just uh, leave it at leave it at that. Uh, and um, they criticized especially bourgeois liberal modernity as a shopkeeper, uh, you know, a shopkeeper's regime, uh, a place where nothing great happened, nothing great could ever happen again. And if you look at Nietzsche's particular criticism of liberalism, he says it's a system of herd animalization, that liberalism only means something as long as it's fighting against monarchy. And that's only because it's actually fighting, because it's promoting the virtues of the warrior. Well, Whereas it, when it when it wins, it leads to uh, e- e- um, cutting down every tall mountain, herd animalization, uh, the Englishman's comfort-based uh, shopkeeper's morality. S- sorry, what were you saying? No, no, because it's funny and ironic because I think the, the primary anti-capitalist, anti-liberal critique in this day and age is that um, liberalism is like hyper individualistic, whereas yes. as our friend Second City bureaucrat has pointed out, it, it's actually the uh, ideology, the mentality of the herd. It's it's group yes. identification. It's group identification. It is, uh, 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 mm, uh, let's say, looking around, finding the regard of others, and determining yourself by that. And it's also. To put it in just, uh, let's say, autistic historical terms, right, Um, historically what existed was thrown and altered. The unity, uh, at times they were in conflict, but between, um, let's say, European aristocracy slash monarchy and the Catholic Church or other churches and so forth. And that was the traditional order of Europe, and it was challenged by the French Revolution and various other strains coming from the French Revolution. And um, that was, let's say, the traditionalist right, which still exists in Europe. Uh, 2% of France, if you can believe it, want the French monarch to return 
in Versailles with the church, mm-hmm. not as like a figurehead, but as it was before 1789. Uh, that's 2% of France. That's an enormous yeah, thing. It's, it still exists in Europe. That's the, tr- that's the traditional right. Then you have the Nietzschean, I don't know if you want to call it radical right or progressive right. And their point is that's all gone. Um, when he says God is dead, uh, he doesn't celebrate that. It's a huge hole that's happened in mankind for reasons we can we, uh, we can get into. But he says the old order, the foundations of it, uh, the belief in it has has gone. It has passed. The traditional right is dead. And we now live in a society that is basically individualist in name only. That's why I'm such an acolyte of Christopher Lash, because he saw very clearly that all these appeals to like hyper individualism were actually in reality arguments for herd mentality for group identity yes it's group narcissism and he, yes and for a guy who wasn't a particularly like original thinker who's who many people have said was more important as a historian rather than a critic he really saw and understood this yes uh, i'm not uh, so familiar with christopher lash i know him from the stuff you guys say from the stuff the bureaucrat says um i i think that's i think he sound he sounds good. Um, if you want, if you want, we can talk about him. My point is, well, they did not like the left's criticism of traditional society because the left's criticism coming from the people like Rousseau yeah. was that uh, you needed a homogenized egalitarian culture that got rid of uh, traditional hierarchies and so on because they were uh, they were unjust, and so. In this sense, in this limited sense, you can call Nietzsche and Schopenhauer right wing that they saw the need for some version of human hierarchy. But the way that relates to the artistic avant-garde uh, is different. I can go on a, uh, uh, yes, would you like to talk about that? Yes, yeah, yeah. How did we reach a point where the uh, normative or dominant or conventional morality became essentially a leftist morality? And how did we arrive at a point where these like so-called emissaries of the hard right are basically spiritual leftists? Uh, well, I don't know what you mean by emissaries of the high right being spiritual leftists. Uh, I I do think that well, people who are like uh, more conventionally right people, wing, as people opposed who are to like progressive yes, right yeah. wing, as you said, like people who are like traditionalists or like uh, Catholic converts or whatever. Yes, who are seen in the in the mainline media and the mainstream consciousness mm-hmm. as right wing figures. Yes. Um, well. Let me, if you don't mind, approach the question from a few other examples. You take the artist as he existed in traditional European society. Um, How did he exist? He had patronage, whether it was from a monarch or from an aristocrat. And because of this patronage, he had to somewhat cater either to that aristocratic faction's prejudices or preferences or to state interest if it was a monarch and so on. And so high art means just uh, art that's developed to the tastes of an aristocracy that has um, had time and leisure to develop uh, very complicated uh, and and fine tastes. When you take that, um, they had to mix it in with support for some kind of traditional morality or religion. Then the left wing took over in the French Revolution, which means what? It became a shopkeeper society, an industrialist society in the 19th century. That's something that never commands... Bourgeois society. (laughs) A bourgeois society that's not glamorous. It doesn't command the interest of... It's, it's not it does it's not gleaming it doesn't command the interests of people it's not seen mm. as sexy by women and so on it's not a scaffold <laughs> it's not a glittering yes image. well it's no. it, it's it, it's not a scaffold on which you can build any kind of uh high culture and it's not a source of sure there were some bourgeois patrons but it's not a source of patronage and so this a change the fact that the source of patronage literally of i guess of money if you want to be vulgar about it it got cut off and so then you have 
the avant-garde artist coming sometime in the 19th century who isn't any longer supported by an aristocratic or a monarchic scaffold. And so what happens is double. Um, on one hand, they are unmoored from having to support any conventional notions. Um, on the other hand, their ambition can rise immensely. This is what Nietzsche says about the Parisian and French artists in the 1850s, that actually Wagner comes out of that world, not out of some kind of Teutonic folkish world. He comes out of the Paris art world of the 1850s and 60s. And uh, out of that comes this enormous ambition that I'm an artist, I'm going to recreate the fundaments of new traditions. I'm going to refound basically a, a religion for all mankind. In part, also, this is supported by Schopenhauer's theories, which see the artist no longer as an entertainer or a, a valet of traditional morality or philosophy, but as a philosopher in his own right, right? The artist is somebody who perceives new things in reality, which is why eventually you get people like Giorgio de Chirico uh, in 1910s who look at the Impressionists before and they say, well, these people like Monet and so on, they're not serious. They uh, only paint when it's sunny outside. They just uh, care about representing the effects of light in, uh, in, <laughs> in the world and so on. And, 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 but they're not showing you anything new about the world, but I'm showing you new things about the world. And so uh, this is how I've, for example, always experienced Giorgio de Chirico and not just me, but many others. Uh, unaware to me, uh, I think it's André Breton, jumped out of a tramway in Paris when he saw one of de Chirico's paintings in, in a gallery. Mm. He, he was saying, um, and he thought, this is the foundation of a new religion. This is, you know, this is amazing. And this is the kind of thing that came out of the so-called Nietzschean, Schopenhauerian philosophy uh, of the avant-garde that inspired this whole generation of artists. Can you call that right wing? I don't think you can, which is why I try to avoid the word, but it's certainly not, the point is it's certainly not left-wing because it rejects entirely. See, nothing of what I just said right now is, can be built on a Marxist or leftist foundation, which is fundamentally about modes of production, economic distribution, and fundamentally, what does that mean? It means about filling the stomach, filling man's material or uh, uh, material necessities it, well, uh, while not needs. addressing, yeah, yes, uh, yes, and thinking that somehow that is a true change to what we've been talking so far about the shopkeepers or bourgeois morality when it's not a true change. All that it, Marxism is, it's, it takes the bourgeois society and it says, we want it faster. We want it egalitarianism faster. We want it at the point of a gun. We want it accelerated. <laughs> and it's, you know, its vision of the end of mankind is nothing. It's just a full stomach. And so it's, aside from very few exceptions like Bertolt Brecht, you can't really find avant-garde artists that are Marxists, they come from this other tradition, whether it's well, traditionalist, it's, yeah, like... it's hostile fundamentally to the artist because yeah. it privileges these, like, material comforts. And as you said early on in the show, um, hunger, really. <laughs> hunger yeah. and suffering yes. are really the, like, bedrocks. New which, Hampson, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, I mean, that's birth of tragedy, right? It's, like, because of the Greeks suffered they were able to reconcile that with like a amazing art form yes exactly the the wisdom of silenus it comes from realization that mere life is not worth living it's the uh, satir silenus it gets caught gets asked what is the purpose of life and he says to die you know never to be born and to die as soon as possible it's just not mere life isn't worth living from any rational calculation and so it was that terror, uh, uh, terror, terror, fundamental insight of the Greeks yeah. that Nietzsche interprets as the cause of all their beautiful creations. Yeah, and like I, I feel like the Schopenhauer was like the first Lacanian. 
<laughs> because he was like, you can't, like, you're going to be fundamentally dissatisfied with right. the things that you really think that you want, but you don't know. But that those are my my big points of agreement with you. I don't remember anything anymore because I have wet brain and I'm a mom. But like that, yes, you said that like the problem of modernity of, and of man in general is not primarily economic and we'll never have an economic solution. And also by that logic that like mm -hmm. the protection of the weak was never an end goal in of itself, but the byproduct of what you would call, I guess, like a hierarchical or aristocratic society. Uh, yes. Uh, Schopenhauer's attacks on the Hegelians actually uh, perfectly are applied to our own time or to Nietzsche's attacks on the left when he says that, you know, all these people want is a well-functioning state that fills people's bellies and makes everything run well. And that fundamentally is can't change the fact that existence is a tawdry thing that can't be redeemed through any uh, material or legalistic fix. And so, yeah, is that right wing? Is Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground a right wing text? On one hand, it's not, obviously. On the other hand... It was banned by the Soviet Union for a reason, right? They banned Dostoevsky up to whatever it was, 1940, for a reason. Uh, all of this, all of these strains coming out of the uh, European avant-garde art uh, uh, world could be called right-wing just by that type of thing alone, you know. <laughs> 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 but I think the conflation of the avant-garde, right, with the left is that it is at war with the so-called bourgeois order. Yes. And that has become sort of the yes. dominion of the left. But there's an alternative. Yes, exactly. <laughs> what is the alternative? <laughs> yes, exactly. And if... If I can hope to reach any of your audience, who I know some of them are leftists, and they have entirely legitimate spiritual grievances with the so-called bourgeois order. I hate that word because even Nietzsche, and that was 150 years ago, he said, you know, criticizing bourgeois the way Flaubert did and so on is, uh, Flaubert and Balzac were criticizing the bourgeois in their own time. Flabby That's kind of Balzac. old hat. It's... Yes, it's it's just it's been it's been overdone and it's no longer really the problem. The problem is the last man who seeks to level every mountain and to homogenize everything because he has a resentment against any kind of distinction. And so uh, if I would hope to reach them is um, me and my friends, we don't come out of the normie conservative world at all. And we agree with you on how bleak it is, uh, you know, the Ned Flanders world, that offers nothing. And it's obvious, it's obviously a failure. They've done it for 50 years or whatever the hell it is. And it's, it's not produced anything. And um, yeah, that's, that's nothing. But that's not what I'm talking about. Um, I'm talking about possibly resurrecting the spirit of this other avant-garde that came out of Nietzsche from 1900 on until it was crushed in 1945. I'm not defending the Nazis, <laughs> by the way, but because they took over, they were at the, at, the, at, the, at the leadership of various other strains that came under their brand. And then when they got crushed, it was as if European society and really all mankind excised half of its face out, like cut off half of its face so as not to be associated with Nazis. And that half of its face was everything having to do with beauty and strength and mankind's possibly reaching beyond this tawdry day-to-day -day life. Yeah, my question is, who is that for? Who does that speak to? Well, I guess, what do you think it is about Nietzsche that appealed so much to the avant-garde artists of the uh, of the earlier century <laughs> he was a, he was a you chaotic bpd ho <laughs> yeah they love that artists love that and it's funny because like mm. uh, there's a lot of charges of misogyny thrown around against nietzsche mm -hmm. whereas i feel he was yes. very in touch with his feminine side no very much like so, he was yeah. speaking uh, about himself primarily 
in a way, he says these are like my truths. Yes, yes. I don't think Nietzsche is actually a misogynist philosopher. Um, he is... As you know, I think it's Luce Irigare, unless I'm pronounced, uh, I'm misremembering her name. But there are mm -hmm. many feminist philosophers who love Nietzsche. I don't read them. I don't know what they say. I don't read him <laughs> at all as that. And um, if if you read uh, my book, which is Popularization of Nietzsche, I was very happy that someone early on noticed, uh, you know, this is not at all a book that's disfavorable to women. Um, I am actually against this misinterpretation of the word longhouse as a synonym for feminism, which the conservative normies have picked up on and have redefined it as a kind of, uh, oh, it's just a synonym for attack on, um, you know, blue-haired Harridan feminists. It's, it's not at all that. Um, <laughs> it's, I, 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 I want to write about this and it won't make any difference once a word becomes misused like that, it doesn't matter. I just mean to say that actually the word longhouse is more an attack on the vast majority of traditional societies as they've existed so far, more on that than on feminism. Who are high, high in estrogen because they're stressed out. Mm -hmm. Wait, you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but Nietzsche primarily uses woman as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. Um, so like feminist scholars love to impugn him with these charges of anti-feminism and misogyny, but essentially they're proving his point because they're making it all about themselves when he's using this metaphor to illustrate a larger point. Well, it isn't just, yes. it isn't just feminist scholars. It's like, I mean, Kaufman himself and some more, some less metaphorical comments need to make about women that I also think are true. Um, like there's like footnotes in Kaufman where he says like these insights are like time bound and shallow. <laughs> He's super <laughs> ungenerous really to like Kaufman. Kaufman to Nietzsche's insights on, yeah, on femininity. He's like that. trying to also cover for his own attraction. Mm, yeah. And like exculpate yeah, himself like a good liberal or whatever. But he's raising yes. these points that are basically incidental to the state, the nature of womanhood. And he's using this state as like a metaphor for like truth or uh, the yes. body politic he, or whatever. He says in Eke Homo, he says in the state of nature, woman has first rank. He's like, he says it. <laughs> And he ascribes his power to his attraction over women, right? Which was, uh, I don't care about his personal life. That's irrelevant. That's vulgar stuff. What he did with women or whether he was alpha or this other kind of garbage. His thought appealed to women even during the lucid portion of his life. And, um, uh, you know, uh, if I may say what I was continuing about earlier, I someone noticed very soon after I published the book. My book is very, very favorable to uh, women. It's not favorable to lower types of life, but uh, there are higher types of uh, women that have existed in the past, for example, oracles and such, which now Tate is misrepresenting. Um, Nietzsche's point is not that he hates women because he's an incel or whatever. <laughs> it's about it's about the particular it's about the particular modern distortions of womanhood, which the modern democratic state is basically a giant big demagogue which tries to masculinize women and use them as its foot soldiers in setting up this. Uh, disgusting, uh, bleak, egalitarian kind of uh, tenement state. That's what I would call it. It's a tenement state. It's a communist uh, public housing state. It's like a mammy state. It's a, it's a mammy state, yes. He it's says, something like um, this. May I, may I quote? <laughs> may I? Whoa, Can whoa. I read? Yes. Um, Please. This is, pro this is probably an echo homo. He says, all feminism too, also in men, closes the door. It will never permit entrance into this labyrinth of audacious insights. One must never have spared oneself. One must have acquired hardness as a habit to be cheerful and in good spirits in the midst of nothing but hard truths. <laughs> so that's basically him like encapsulating like the Slavoid philosophy. 
that hardness in the face for cheerful. What what it, what was the the thing about the labyrinth of audacious insights? Yeah. That should be the title of Bap's uh, Anthony Bourdain style <laughs> culinary <laughs> adventure show. That's what I call podcast. Yes, I, 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 I want to have uh, in the future a what you said a Bourdain type show, but not him. He's a fucking faggot, you know. Like um, he really is. And he was killed by the uh, he was killed by the Obamas, of course, with a doorknob course, suicide. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because him and Obongo did whatever down low stuff. I but, really, um, I really grew to dislike Anthony Bourdain on that airplane. Yeah, I hate to say it. I'll tell you why I dislike him because of his Columbia episode where he celebrates this disgusting dish, the sancocho, <laughs> which is uh, <laughs> like a communal pot dish where they put everything that the community uh. brings to it. Um, <laughs> and uh, well, I have more to say about it, but uh, friends, no, no, no. Uh, we, we've, been, we've been another hour. No. Would you mind? Yeah. To you take, want to take uh, another a short, break? Yes, uh, of course. A short five-minute smoke break. While well, Brennan is here, he's giving me a blowjob. <laughs> <and, you know. laughs> okay, yes. we'll talk to you after you come. <laughs> Very good, yes. <laughs> We're back. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have, I have a question. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, about you being the contemporary popularizer of Nietzsche. Yes. Um, You said, you mentioned you you feel feel good about this. Um, I have more ambivalent feelings about (laughs) Nietzsche's recent popularity. Um, How do you feel, how does this make you feel that Nietzsche was, (laughs) you know, in a self-described as someone who was not meant to be read, you know, by the majority of people. Yes, I'm glad you asked this because um, when I wrote the book, I had no idea it would spread so far. Um, I was told through someone else, I think it was by Rouge, who I'm not a fan of, by the way, we can talk about him, but he, he transmitted to me, I should be happy if it would sell 500 copies and I, I knew it would sell a bit more than that. I thought, okay, a thousand or two thousand, that would be great. Um, and it sort of went far beyond what I expected. And now you're seeing, for whatever reason, I don't know what, uh, I, have, I can only speculate, there are almost weekly articles about me. By the way, there are bigger ones I hear coming soon. I don't know what they're trying to do. I don't think they're smart enough to be doing it for the following reason, which is that they could suffocate me with attention. Um, I'm not saying this to be a snob, but I really wrote the book for a few friends online, and I was not expecting it to be like this. And Nietzschean, uh, let's say, antinomian, Karpokratian, Vajrayana, whatever you want to call it, um, thought isn't really (laughs) transmittable to a mass audience. And when Mm. you try to do that, um, yes, it doesn't work. So uh, I just want to tell maybe uh, whoever is listening, Um, I was on forums in, let's say, 2010, 2011 with maybe 11, 12, 13 people. And we were motivated. It's like Jesus and his disciples. (laughs) For the reason that modern life seems incredibly bleak and homogenized and purposeless to you. We were on it for that reason. And... My only message is if you are on the left and your objection to modern life is that it's a bleak, homogenized mess with that feels like an iron prison, then the way out of it, the path out, the only path out is this tradition of Nietzsche and Schopenhauer radical philosophers who were really obfuscated, distorted and suppressed, especially after 1950. And um, it's not, in fact, transmittable in its full form to a mass audience. I completely agree with you. I didn't write my book for a mass audience. I'm obviously happy any writer is flattered and happy that their book's doing well. 
but I do feel that they could, as I say, suffocate me with attention. Uh, imagine, uh, you know, this ancient sect, the Carpocratians, right? The, it's mm. an ancient Christian sect. And they taught that the only path to salvation was basically committing every atrocity in the Bible. <laughs> uh, and because they believed the God of the Bible was the demiurge and therefore Satan. And the only way to paradise was to traduce his law in every single point. And yeah. uh, so uh, obviously that's not something that you can transmit to a mass audience. I'm not saying that's my view and it would send you to jail yeah. if it was taken seriously, but it's something, let's say, in that general sphere. And so, yeah, I agree with you. And the general popularizations of it, such as you see with Tate and uh, others online is, are pathetic and I have nothing to do with. Yes. Well, that, sounds, <laughs> that all sounds super heretical. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but how do you feel about your personal influence, particularly on the the recent indictments on the so-called uh, avant-garde? Well, I don't know enough about them, but I think if I could inspire people <laughs> to write books and make movies or other arts things, because that's really what my intention was. It was not... I'm not, again, saying this for merely self-political, uh, excuse, excuse me, self-protection reasons, but I'm not stupid. I don't think that... Interesting Freudian slip. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I just don't think that a political solution in the direct sense is possible because we have such small numbers now. We have absolutely no power. Uh, there are people who come online who imagine themselves dictators and that they need to put out takes and they're kind of uh, yeah. the dictator from on high saying we should do this, we should do that. Um, it leads to many confusions. No, I am happy if I can inspire some people to do, I think actually uh, I have friends who could write better books than mine. They're not doing it out of caution or uh, depression or many other such things. I don't know. Mm. Why did you write your book? Was it out of um, mm. desperation <laughs> and frustration or a desire for revenge? I, I don't know if it was out of, out of either. I just felt compelled to write it for my friends. I felt at the time, actually, that I was going to die sometime soon. And so I had to, uh, I had to put out some restatement of Nietzscheanism that had not been done um, for really a hundred years. Uh, that's the greatest compliment that my friend Loki paid to me. He said, this is the best restatement of Nietzsche in a hundred years. He also said, it's a great sued filter uh, because mm. it's stated in a popular fashion and it encourages uh, pseudo, pseudo intellectuals to pronounce on it and to attack it. Uh, without and but they perhaps don't realize that uh, a lot of thought went into it and was based on long time reading of people like some of the thinkers I've named so far. The first review of my book was in Swedish, came out within days and um, mentioned the writer Klages. And so Europeans have always understood what I was trying to do. It is only in the American context that it caused these tumults because, again, the conservative right in the United States, the conservative normy right, uh, which has bungled everything for decades and has led to nothing productive, uh, they've always felt very th threatened by, I by what I was trying to do. Um, excuse the tangent, but as to why I wrote it, um, I maybe don't have the psychological impact, uh, uh, excuse me, insight into myself to say, uh, to, to say why. It is just a statement for my friends. But I think uh, other things coming out of your friend's world is, uh, is very promising. And uh, the, the reaction it's causing among the strivers on the literary intelligentsia is uh, uh, a sign that maybe we are over the target, so, so called. What do you mean? I just mean that the glut of these articles coming out mm -hmm. uh, speaks to a desperation on the part of people who imagine themselves as gatekeepers to thought and see perhaps uh, that. Uh, maybe uh, a 
hegemonic leftist chokehold on thought in mm -hmm. the United States is about to to break sometime uh, soon, soonish, but that could be in the next decade or two, I don't know. I think it's, it's kind of already broken. The left has castrated itself, you know, it's... Yeah. Uh, I, I know uh, through other sources that for example, the big fashion houses in Europe and so on are completely exasperated with the so-called woke thing, with the politicization, the moralism. And the fact is the left has castrated itself because it's rejected uh, beauty, it's rejected uh, anything uh, higher than mere life, which is always an inherent possibility, possibility in the left, but they, they took their own bait in a way. And so now there's this hole and um, I don't think they can stop it. I don't think they can stop anything from filling this hole, you know. Yes. Yeah, that's true. But what happens next? I'm also like running. Out of steam. <laughs> Anna's <done. laughs> um, Anna's drunk. Uh, are you both drunk? Uh, are you both drunk? Yeah. You can ask no, me anything. No, we're drunk. Uh, we're drunk. We're drunk. Wait, I do have a, a question for you. That's about the musics. Yes, I'm happy to answer. But I want to tell you this anecdote. I knew this complete yes. schizophrenic. He had. I know you guys had uh, delicious tacos on your show. He's a good friend of mine. He. He loves Filipino prostitutes. This, friend, <laughs> yes. this other friend of mine is in, uh, must be in his sixties by now. Um, I, I wanted <laughs> I wanted to have him on the show, but he's heavily lobotomized by medication. However, when I knew him, uh, maybe ten, twelve years ago, he was he was much more manic, and he would meet me in he would meet me in restaurants, and he would there would be people around. And he would talk in this loud nasal voice like this. He would, he would give me uh, detailed rundowns. He was a genuine artist, not like a fake online artist. He would talk about the African hunting dog and the hyena and their mating rituals. And he uh, was obsessed with animals and military history, a true... A true artist on antipsychotic drugs. A he true had spark, been in, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, he had been in the Philippines, like delicious tacos. He told me, uh, do you know uh, what the average lifetime sexual partners is for an American man? And I said, uh, no, no, what is it, Owen? And he's, he's like, uh, it's five or six. That, that's outrageous. I would be so frustrated. I must have been with hundreds of prostitutes. <laughs> Um, and so he did this in the Philippines and had been in prison, actually, in a Manila mental asylum multiple times. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and But he had these in intense interests on, on uh, animals, as I say, military history and some other su such things. <laughs> and whenever he would stop one of his rants uh, and uh, you know, there'd be people around, he's like, well... Uh, uh, what else do you want to talk about? Ask me anything. <laughs> Ask me anything. So uh, this is uh, what I say to you now. Ask me whatever you like. What do you want to ask me? Well, is there anything else you'd like to say about the avant-garde? Well, there, I mean, there are many things I, I want to say. I want to, talk, <laughs> I, I, I want to talk about, you know, women and the avant-garde, for example. Yes. We started to talk before yes. about women. Now, uh, something people miss, the fact is... People like Yukio Mishima, who in American popular culture is understood as this gay who wrote this book, Sun and Steel, about bodybuilding as a spiritual self-overcoming and these other books about samurai uh, against self-sacrificing and so forth. You it's, don't think Mishima uh, was gay? No, I don't. I think it's a misunderstanding. I mean, you know, um, actually, I... I was talking about him recently and um, these uh, so-called traditional Catholics, which I'm happy, by the way, to talk about also, and mm -hmm. the the the, the, the so-called <laughs> the so-called online traditionalist. And their, wait, hold on, uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go have a snack. Wait, you keep talk I really, I really, my blood sugar is plummeting. Anna's dying. She needs to get. I'm gonna have a snack, well, but do, I want to hear about Mishima. Hold on, I'll hold on. Sorry, Anna's leaving. She's no, I'll she'll be, be back. I'm she'll gonna be, back. be right back. What are you like, gonna have? Well, well, let's take a <laughs> let's take a snack, and I'm going to have a chocolate. Is that okay? Well, you guys want to take a quick snack break? She's getting a snack. Yeah. When the Dionysian revelry hits, what are you eating? A meatball. Oh, okay. <laughs> you have a tiptielka. They don't call me lasagna Anna can for nothing. I'm a very good cook of meat products. Meatball? Yeah, do you want a meatball? Yeah. Okay, hold on. I have an erudite question for you. 
Uh-huh. I read an essay of yours that was like in the same issue of a very obscure right wing magazine that we was both in, where you said that classical music is the music of the right wing and that uh-huh. there is that there's no music of the left wing. And yes. my question is, what about jazz? The eclectic avant garde music of urban blacks and Jews. Yes. Is that not the music of leftism? Well, look, it could be the music of leftism, and uh, I know people who hate jazz more than they hate hip-hops. And, Me. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes. And Dasha. Yes. Don't, we don't um, like jazz. As a cultural <laughs> association, uh, sure, jazz could be seen for the reasons you said, because it's associated with certain demographics and political factions. But I would answer to that same as Soviet socialist, realist, whatever you want to call it, or Soviet Red Army music, that is supposedly as left-wing as it gets. But in the spiritual registers, let's say, that Soviet military music accesses, those are not left-wing at all. They're just revolutionary, violent impulses that young people love, and so they love that music. And... um, As I repeat to you, in the Marxist end state, I think I say this in the article you're mentioning, in the Marxist end state, which is a state of no necessity, a state where uh, all uh, human duty of any kind and burden has ended, uh, that's not really the music of the Soviet military system. Uh, Now, it's much closer what you're saying now. That could be the music of jazz, because jazz in its meandering perhaps represents the end of uh, some type of, of uh, central uh, ego in, uh, in music, central subject in music, whatever you want to call it. It, it leads to feeli- feelings of dissolution of the ego. Mm. Uh, maybe, well, maybe, hmm. maybe it does. Uh, but by that standard, so does certain ambient electronic music, maybe. Um, yes. By that standard, so does, let's say, white noise, if, which I enjoy listening to when I sleep sometimes. <laughs> um, so yeah. uh, uh, these could be said to be left-wing music because they lead to the solution of all desire and all longing and all ego. But well, I don't frankly... Think I don't think that's true, though. But yeah, I I think when you right. think it through, I, I think when you think it through, there that, that that it isn't true. That actually, all of these, including jazz, do have some longing built into them. And so maybe actually the music of the left is Hootie and the Blowfish. It's it's super, <laughs> it's, it's it's supermarket background crap music, you know, like that. Yeah. Well, as Schopenhauer says, <laughs> Hootie was our guy. Hootie <laughs> was our guy. No. <laughs> um, and I haven't even really read Schopenhauer, so I'm paraphrasing Nietzsche here, but he says that music is the language of the will. And jazz music, in its defense, though I don't listen to it or enjoy it, <laughs> is like improvisational. It, the whole point of jazz right is to like fill this like kind of like negative space to with fill, improvisational to fill flourishes with, with bleepity bleepity. Yeah, yeah with whatever bullshit you want that's willful no how do we feel about chet baker i don't know i don't know particular jazz performers but i should say there is a black frog who keeps uh writing me about music and who points out that many of the early jazz as well as ragtime black performers were very much influenced by Scriabin, you know, the Russian, although his music has no Russian qualities about it. And Scriabin's whole thing was that he was accessing outer dimensional entities. And he was completely uh, exactly one of the most... uh, uh, prime examples of what I'm talking about when I say avant-garde, weird, right-wing, quote-unquote right-wing artist. W- what did he want to do? He was he was born on Christmas Day and mm-hmm. he died on Easter Day and he had this plan. Wait, isn't that what happened to Jesus? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. 
He understood himself in this way, Scriabin he, did. He was? Yes, for, well, for your audience who are boors, Scriabin was a composer around 1900 or so. And he understood him, he, I think he died 1915, but he understood himself as founding uh, an entirely new world and his last composition, Mysterium, was going to be performed in the Himalayas um, on several mountaintops, mixing music, uh, <laughs> smell, uh, s s smell uh, paintings and, and um, colors, you know, like colored lights. And he thought it would inaugurate a new era of, of, uh, of mankind. Um, and he died, before he, could, he died before he could complete it. And it is out of this insane, uh, overly ambitious desire to be a prophet, uh, composer that actually the black jazz artists you're talking about, they took many of his chords, many of his innovations, and they made this kind of popular urban music out of it. And so is that... Could, they sampled it. They, they, yeah, they, exactly. They sampled it. So can you say that is left-wing music? I, I don't think it's left-wing music. I mean, it's, you know, so... Whatever it's, it's extraneous demographic, uh, you know, the demographics who prefer this music may be. I don't think in its spiritual content that jazz is actually left-wing so-called music, you know. Right. Well, in so, in so much as... Mm -hmm. but, but for the reasons you're saying, actually, uh, Nietzsche says without music, life would be a mistake. And Schopenhauer says music is really a copy of the will through another through another uh, means. Mm -hmm. And so it's not therefore possible for a music that actually touches you and that moves you to be quote unquote left wing because left wing has to do with Marx again with, uh, or with Marxist impulses, which are either have to do with distribution of economic goods or when you wipe that economic aspect away, it has to do with resentment that any kind of distinction and any kind of longing for a higher life exists at all. And so leftism is really a rejection of the spirit of music entirely. I, maybe, uh, maybe you don't agree. Maybe you think I'm overstating, but I feel that way. No, yes. I wouldn't disagree with that. But my question is, I guess, that if music is the language of the will that even even mu music that's sort of made by a committee well okay i guess i'm answering it myself but like uh music that's uh, <laughs> like <laughs> if there was to be a left-wing music right it would be kind of like mm, produced or like they wouldn't have any trace left of like an in individual will because if it's still, but if it's meant to uh, inspire any music, I think even popular music is meant to inspire some sort of yes. feeling. Racism. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't really care about its provenance. It could be even artificial intelligence that produces it as long as it evokes genuinely strong feelings. I don't see... Uh, but anyway, this may be kind of a frivolous conversation about which, uh, what music is right wing or left wing. Uh, I don't think that's, uh, I, I do think the left wing is spiritually bankrupt. I don't think it's frivolous in that sense. The left wing is spiritually bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And so the only left wing music is really supermarket music of the, let's say, late 90s, early 2000s, Hootie and the Blowfish variety that just makes you want to put a gun to your temple. That's left wing <laughs> music to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. But even who, I mean, there's an emotional content. What about John Mayer? I, I do not know this. Who is John Mayer? Do you know Lana Del Rey? Yes, everybody likes Lana Del Rey. I don't know her so well, but you everyone don't likes to her. her. I, don't, I actually don't like Lana Del Rey yes, that you much. Do. I do. I like her, but Perry Abbasi was correct. And, and I don't not like her. I listen to her music all the time, but I don't really care all that much. I'm not like a huge Lana Del Rey stan. I was very angry at him at the time, but he was right. I said early on that, that BAP, BAP was Lana Del Rey for men <laughs> because a big motif in Lana's music is like wildness. <laughs> like, <laughs> and like being crazy and stuff. Yes. 
No, I, lo- I love she's Lana. She's a great artist. I think, I think she's probably the best singer or songwriter that we have currently going for our generation. Yeah. Many sensitive young men love Lana Del Rey. They feel that it captures the mm-hmm. feeling of a late summer. And uh, there's, yes. I, I've heard one or two songs. Again, everyone <laughs> hears them. But I, I, I don't know so much major pop music i don't listen to it the only modern music i much listen to is uh electronic music and so on which um has some let's say ego dissolution effects but uh i don't know that you can politicize it one way or another but i'm happy to talk to you about the uh the woman problem you brought yes, up yes i in want to speak we want to i want to talk about about women what, wait i have a question what is the start and end point of gemini season <laughs> I'm just trying to. Just uh, sounds uh, like, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, the audience may like to know that we're several bottles or whatever into our conversation now. But I'm really um, drunk, but I do have a, a meaningful. I am completely here. lucid. I am totally lucid. If I sound drunk, I'm only pretending to be that way because it's socially expected of me. But please it's repeat. May, your, it's May, May late May through late June. June. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Alana please, Del Rey. Yes. <laughs> Is June twenty first. She is on the cusp. That's what, is, that's where I'm going with cusp. this. She's on the cusp of Gemini and Cancer. So she is a Gemini. A Gemini, yes. as you know, are the great <laughs> artists of the zodiac. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Donald Trump, Azalea Banks, Morrissey, our guest wow. here, Lana Del Rey. I consider her. She's a honorary Gemini. She is. No, yes. I think she. Yeah, yeah. She's Gemini coded for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that was my point. <laughs> we were trying yes. to talk about women, Anna. Women, women. Women suck. They're yes. evil. They're vir- viragos inheritance. Yes. Uh, however, the uh, question you, you asked me a few minutes ago, would you mind repeating it? Because the New World Order is interfering with our which signal. One, I couldn't... Which one? Which one? <laughs> oh, um, um, yeah. Tell, just tell us how you really feel about women. <laughs> <laughs> He's simping. Um, you may notice that Yukio Mishima uh, mm. has uh, achieved stardom by appealing actually to women. So I think we were interrupted a little bit earlier when I was pointing out that the false impression of Mishima is that he's some kind of gay author who, again, spiritualized bodybuilding or um, was talking about extreme uh, samurai self-sacrifice and so on. Uh, what, um, What people are missing from that picture is that during his own lifetime, and the reason, therefore, that we know about him at all, is that in the Japan of of his time, which is 1950s, 60s, and so on, he became very popular through his stories of urban, I don't like this word, uh, maybe not degeneracy, but decay. It's a beautiful decay, told in such books as Forbidden Colors, After the Banquet, and many other ones that are being translated now, kind of pop novels that Mm -hmm. uh, also my friend Masaki is translating and he was enormously popular in Japan because of his appeal to women. Uh, similarly, there are many others. Uh, let's say again, Bronze Age pervert, we're, we're like Bronze Age pervert <laughs> and Friedrich Nietzsche. Yes, we were talking about Nietzsche a lot on this show. Nietzsche had many female enthusiasts. Uh, I pointed like, out what was Isadora her name, Lou Salome was just dur- the one during his lifetime, and he, he was she was kind of maybe his one-itis and so on. She's not that relevant overall in his general influence, but women like Isadora Duncan, who was an experimental uh, avant-garde dancer. She's a dancer. Dancer. Yeah. Uh, yes, and a self-described Nietzschean, but there are many others like her and mystics and so forth who loved Nietzsche. The, it was women in the modern world who popularized people like Nietzsche, like Mishima, who are my literary and artistic idols. And why is this important? Well, it has to do with what we've been talking about so far on this show. I do think that, you know, uh, for all my attacks on roasties and such, which I do, I, I, I do not retract... I do not retract. I'm not being a cuck and a simp to women. I do not retract my attacks on roasties. 
That being said, and it's in the book, so I'm, I'm not saying anything I haven't said before, but uh, as Nietzsche says, women have no patience for the so-called selfless objective man. And it is this self-effacing nobody man, uh, the gray man that uh, modernity in general is promoting, including, unfortunately, large parts of the right with their IQ fetishization, where they're, they're promoting really the shopkeeper and the clerk with this IQ stuff. Really, it's, they're promoting the office worker. But um, women hate that. Women hate that. And, uh, and, and I believe it is this through the spirits of women that the uh, vehemence of the will can... Uh, replenish life can cause a reset. They will not abide so, this kind of gray, homogenized, nothing world. They want, they want vitality. They want men who are powerful. Uh, I don't mean in the status sense. I mean in the sense of having true being. And so that's why they continually call for and promote these types of visions of life, of visions of high life, like come out of Nietzsche and Mishima, regardless of what Nietzsche's personal life was like. That doesn't matter, you know. What is it about certain men who are not... Fascists. (laughs) Fascists who are not necessarily incels, but who are incel-coded that appeals to women? Well... I, I don't know. I haven't thought about that question, to be honest. I think uh, if just if you put me on the spot, if I had to guess, uh, it's uh, maybe. Uh, uh, do you think it could be a kind of of uh, animal pity, like you see for a caged uh, caged lion, maybe that? No, that a woman no. Holds, I think uh, I think it has to do with a disinterest. I think it has to. I have to quote Eric Weinstein here, who I know (laughs) that many of us are not a fan of. (laughs) Yes. He had this line about how (laughs) certain aspects of of human behavior code for credibility. I think being like an an insult, i.e. a guy who is indifferent to the emotions and motives of women codes for credibility. It's Mm. like kind of like being a bully. People like, people prefer bullies to bullied. Yes. Even though it's very uncouth and impolite to admit this fact. Because being a bully codes for confidence, assertiveness, even though obviously bullies are deeply insecure. Maybe it's because Mm -hmm. the incel-coded man is the man who is the credible man in the minds of women. I think there's something to that. Yes, it could be. I, uh, I have not thought so much about the incel question because... Um, for me to brand yourself as an incel, actually, you are determining yourself by the thoughts of what women, you know, the thoughts of women, what, uh, their regard for you and so on. Right. I mean, if you actually are indifferent to what women think, you wouldn't openly call yourself an incel and make a big thing out of that. Uh, I, I was very much against this movie, TFW No GF, made... <laughs> By, uh, by our friend heard. Alex Lee Moyer, yes. We know her very well, yeah. Yes, by her. I thought that was an attack on me and my friends uh, because... Well, okay. I don't think so. I think I, Alex is sympathetic. I think it... Mm, yeah. Whatever, whatever. I mean, it's just that in the incel movement came out of 4 which culture is... the like. Culture is downstream from 4chan. I really think this. Uh, yes, but as you know, incel is a law enforcement keyword. I'm not saying that Alex Lee Moyer and whoever made that movie was openly motivated by... Well, it's not a crime to get no pussy. <laughs> well, no, but... Okay, but setting yes. aside... Well, like, forget the incel. The, this is a bad terminology, but uh, women are, are attracted to men who are fundamentally indifferent to them. Yes, c- could be, but um, I I don't think it's a general. I don't think that's generally true. I think they may be. Uh, look, I I don't want to offer uh, 
whatever you're inviting me to offer here, if it's game <laughs> advice or what, 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 what women not, are sexually... That's not, what we, that's not, uh, that's not, no, no. Uh, what women are, are or are not sexually attracted to, I have no opinion on. I, I am just against the so-called incel branding because um, although it does cover some noble sentiments, for example, there are people who brand themselves as incels, but who like, for example, the book Sorrows of Young Werther by Goethe, and yeah. the reason they call themselves incels is because they have a strong, passionate belief in young love, and they very much despise the pickup artist culture that uh, came out of Hartiste and so on right. in, the, in the early 2000, uh, 2010s, I mean. And um, they don't want to be clowns for women. They don't want to play this game so-called of... Uh, well, what do women like? And you have to act such and such a way. They want genuine, sincere, young love. And that's very respectable. But I don't see why they have to call themselves incels. When you do that, you are actually uh, entirely well, they're determining... Well, recla they're reclaiming it, like the N-word. They're like... <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, insist so. they're insisting on a romantic... Their idea about love. That's why many incels have one itises and what and whatnot. Um, they want. I think they. It's an. Uh, it's an aspirational term ultimately, and but it does. I think also probably doom some some people with an over identification. But to circle back to to women, right? Nietzsche, yes. Nietzsche as Nietzsche says, he says women love him, <laughs> and I think yes. he's correct. And he says except for abortive women yes in which he goes on to describe as the women who lack the capacity for children but i think is really speaking more broadly to i don't know don't you think most women nowadays are abortive in their spirit even, even women they, who even have, children. have children yeah uh, yes i uh, i think that most women today are uh, probably uh, spiritual mental cripples, so are most men. <laughs> um, I, uh, I I don't think there's much use in in dwelling on uh, their deformities. I mean, they're somewhat interesting, but uh, the problem of the problem of dwelling of, on degeneracy, so-called or deformity, is uh, uh, well. It, the well, problem is that this? it gives you a false moral high ground. And a way, a means of deflecting your own deformity. Yes, uh, I, I like, I prefer much more the narrator from Notes from Underground who declares that he knows he's not even a bug. He's not even worthy to be a bug. Mm -hmm. And uh, But he is genuinely superior to other modern people because he recognizes that and they don't. I, I think a great novel, uh, or not, it doesn't need to be a novel, it could be a... Um, could be a, a movie, could be a, any number of forms of expression, of honesty like that could come out of what you call the incel thing now and its confrontation with the deformed femininity and deformed men that are around today. The, the, one of the big obstacles that's in the way of that is the moralism of the uh, online right that's been introduced since, let's say, 2017, uh, which I'm also happy to comment on because um, many of the older, uh, let's say 2015 and before posters mm. who conf confronted many of these same issues you're bringing up now without calling themselves openly incel. Again, I, I don't like that branding. It's like, what's the point? You're declaring, oh, I don't get no pussy and I'm mad. It's not... Um, <laughs> again, it's entirely a female, uh, a female centered branding, but there were people before 2015 <laughs> and some after who, who dealt with these matters. Many of us got banned. And then let's say around 2017, we got replaced by these political actors who came in after Trump. Uh, they were actually against Trump in the beginning, but they got a little glint in the eye. They saw media attention to our sphere, in part because of things we had done, in part because of what Trump had brought. But these are really the conservanormy types. Uh, some of them are, um, you can say, hardcore racists of a stupid variety, but they come out generally out of the 
Ted Cruz uh, Santorum wing of the Republican Party. They are heavily moralistic and they are very much concerned with this word degeneracy, which I understand and maybe I gather from what you're saying, you understand in biological terms, perhaps, or psychological terms, but they interpret it entirely morally. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you're seeing a glut yes, of, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. of closet cases and also, um, let's say, people from uh, the, the Middle East and areas further east of that who are beige and <laughs> resent the fact that... Uh, resent the fact that oh white women... God. Uh, yes, uh, they they perhaps resent the fact that white women um, are uh, more promiscuous than the women they're used to from their cultures, but will not sleep with them. And so around this is built up a whole um, moral tirade that they then present online. And that's become, mm. unfortunately, very much slowly it's becoming the face of the right with people like Tate and so on. I wish Tucker would not promote him. Mm hmm. The body yes. count thing, that, that's become like a pet cause of the <laughs> online right and the trad casts. <laughs> Very oh, confusing yeah. to me yeah. because let's be real. Everybody likes a slut. Sluts are fun and exciting and a good time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what everybody <laughs> yes. wants. So I'm confused by this moral purity arc, which is very un-avant-garde. I'm not confused by it. I, I think it's stupid. Um, I think that, uh, as my friend Delicious Taco says, uh, the, the very opposite is the truth. Women need to be bigger hoes. They're not big hoes enough. Um, and uh, the, 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 um, the attempt, for example, look, let me give you an example. We were able largely to shame obesity, to shame fat people. Uh, and but that's, that's a project of ours as well. <laughs> the, uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you. They're trying to interrupt. They're trying to stop. You, um, you know, like George Bush said. George Bush said they, they're trying to stop the love between gynecologists and women. He he has a line like that. And um, well, the the obese are are easily <laughs> shamed because they're like internally ashamed. So yes, well, any criticism of them triggers an internal monologue. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very simple. Fatness shows and you can't hide it. And everybody agrees that a a fat girl or a fat man is, is unsightly. And so it's easy to make fun of that. When it comes to body count, there are a lot of cope things that come, as you're pointing out, uh, that... You know, they try to make points about the thousand cock stare, which doesn't really exist, or that women it sure who sleep. Does. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe. But they're saying that, um, let's say, taking uh, loads and loads of cum or whatever, that taking uh, taking many cocks or whatever shows somehow physically. But the fact is, it doesn't. It doesn't show physically. And mm. if you look at, um, you don't need to look at, for example, Daily Mail. Daily Mail has um, repeated reports on this where they show examples of uh, uh, which women have high body counts and which don't. And the ones with relatively high body count are always attractive, let's say, 21 or 22-year-old college students who've bang many men and the ugly uh, and the ugly fat ones have low body counts and if you look throughout uh, european history you find similar uh where uh the most highly desired women courtesans geishas whatever you want king's mistresses the french king's mistresses some of whom were actually ex prostitutes had very high body counts and nobody thought a second thing about it. Now, of course, they didn't want their wives to have that, but they cared much less about their wives. The, pur the purpose of the wife was the preservation of the patrilineal uh, bloodline and so forth, and uh, the preservation of property and and and, and, and uh, within family lines. But uh, as a matter of romantic interest, nobody actually thought that a woman with a high body count historically was something disgusting or undesirable. And that has become a recent, as you say, obsession among 
I don't think it's actually just the online right that are these so-called traditionalist left and leftist Catholics and so forth online who also raise a big thing about that. Um, yes, uh, I I think it's a it's a pathetic fixation, um, and it's uh, it makes a mockery out of people who try to do that. Uh, I know it'll get me hate from people on my side to say this, but I think. Any objection in that uh, direction comes pre-caricatured. In, mm -hmm. in other words, um, whatever part of society at large, uh, whether you want to call it the left or whatever it is, has successfully caricatured people who complain about that as absurd. And I don't think it's really possible to shame people about that. Even if you were able to establish, let's say, a general consensus that that's bad, women would just be able to hide that. So it, it's, it's not, whereas they would not be able to hide fatness, which is I, what I mentioned. <laughs> um, right. The real, the real body count that matters is your BMI. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yes, it's, yes, it's the kilogram count. And you contain many bodies within you <laughs> by virtue of being fat and having to pay for an extra plane ticket. It's a big problem. It's a big problem. And the reason why it doesn't make sense really to talk about the so-called online right or whatever has drawn attention before, because it's become almost uh, where uh, online right means a daily denunciation of, uh, oh, this girl has such and such body count and that girl's a mud shark and it has that body count. And it's, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a complete waste of time, you attack. I think. Um, <laughs> Don't attack yes. Anna like that. Don't attack us. <laughs> But yes, the, the whole body count discourse is a matter of the uh, progressive retardation of, uh, uh, of the right wing as it exists now. And it's caused by these factions, I'm saying, by the bow tie conservatives, many of whom are closet cases with purity spiral, and uh, they're excessively concerned with showing that, um, let's say, a fornication with women is sodomy, and, you know, blowjobs are, uh, blow are mouth sodomy, uh, kissing a woman <laughs> is mouth sodomy, and they're, they're very much concerned with showing to, uh, and you figure out why, that, um, let's say, fornication between men and women, premarital, as it occurred in Western society for decades, decades, if not centuries already, is just as bad as sodomy. They're very much concerned with proving that for whatever reason. And these are a big part of the American conservative right wing, and they've always been. Um, and to these, you can add various other kind of retards, such as ex-roasties with a complicated past who found <laughs> Jesus. And, and, uh, and, you know, they found Jesus, and now they, yeah. they want, uh, uh, you, you know, they want their new husband not to make them want ever do what they did in their past and this yeah. extra thing of somebody from Rajasthan or let's say <laughs> Dubai or Albania who um, okay. it has entirely weaponized affects and has uh, that's uh, very mean uh, to say about your friend Niccolo but okay <laughs> Well, yeah, and, and, and there are many, you know, Nick, yeah, I don't mean Niccolo. I, there are many things I disagree with Niccolo. I don't have it in mind what I say, but, but no, no, you no, know, we're just, yeah, we're we're the, the, yeah, and these people <laughs> come with uh, sideways visors and have so called social media panels with OnlyFans that secretly they are there to mm -hmm. promote and daily denunciations of body count women and no yo you are traducing the love and this kind of thing and um yes uh it's an embarrassment and uh, none of my friends have anything to do with that so well let me ask you a question related to something you were saying do you think the sun has set on sort of the glory day of the at least on on Twitter or X, as it's now called, <laughs> um, the the online right. Yes and no. I think that there are actually many good posters now, maybe even more than there were in 2016 and certainly than in 2017. On the other hand, 
there's been so much attention focused on us that it's drawn dozens and hundreds and thousands of retards that we are flooded absolutely by imbeciles. Well, that you're responsible and for. They're your problem now. They are my problem. They're also part, you know, to be fair, you guys have uh, interacted with us. Uh, <laughs> um, it's our uh, fault. And, it's and, not our and, fault. And, uh, well, as you know, there are, there are many who, who desire the the New York art, art whole thing. And so um, when you interact with us, it draws, it draws many, it draws many. And uh, they have high hopes of... At the very least, um, literary uh, um, validation or uh, some type of many hope for a literary career. And so, yes, it draws many, many morons to our side. And that's kind of, again, suffocated us with attention. And mm. um, We're sorry. Uh, I, 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 no, it's not you, but it, it's it, that's part of the, the story. But yes, it's it. It has led to a lessening of of quality on our side. Um, uh, censorship had something to do with it, and uh, then self censorship in response to that. But um, I'm afraid you're right. Yes, and the only solution out of it is for the old posters who have new ideas, who have humor, to produce things that they have not yet produced. I believe that. There are people on our side who could make books, movies, whatever, that are much better than what I did. But for whatever reason, they're not doing it yet. Don't be so humble. Yeah, don't be so humble. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a question. I have a question. Okay. Anna doesn't like De Kiriko. No, I don't not. I don't <laughs> not like De Kiriko. I just, he's not my favorite artist. My favorite artists are... The Russians of the Silver Age preceding the communist revolution. <laughs> I like the Kiriko, Giorgio de Kiriko very much. I've posted him for a long time. Yes. I have heard your uh, show when you discussed my book. Uh, I don't remember exactly what you said, Anna, but you said you are not a huge fan of De Chirico because he tries to capture something about Renaissance paintings, loneliness, a feeling. I'm not sure what you said. I didn't mm. completely agree with that. I'd like to comment on that. But do you remember exactly more or less what you said there? I remember I said I don't like a lot of De Chirico paintings because they remind me of when I had to go to Hoover Dam <laughs> as a child. <laughs> I don't remember saying anything about Renaissance <clears throat> paintings. Uh, for me, De Chirico uh, is a kind of lesser artist, much like J.K. Stephen, my favorite Victorian era poet, is described as a lesser poet because he didn't attain some sort of greatness. But De Chirico doesn't quite hit for me ever. I mean, I understand the appeal of De Chirico because he has the, I, I said this on Twitter once, he has the same kind of like solemn, uncanny aesthetic that a lot of Italians do from like Fellini to Geary. Pasolini has a little bit of this. It's like in the, in the blood of Italians. Yes. But he like, who's the other guy? Who's the, the umbrellas mm. guy? Hmm. Do you know? Magritte. Magritte. He, like Magritte, does not quite hit for me. Yes, I'm not a huge fan of Magritte. And um, I know what you're saying about the Italians. Uh, Antonioni has this feeling, too. Yes. I mm. think... He could, Antonioni could never quite wrap up a story. And so he masqueraded his inability to, to stick <laughs> the landing with, like, uncanny and mystique. Mm. Even yes, though he is I, a great filmmaker at the end of the day. And yes, by the way, when I, I when I criticize artists and filmmakers, I want to make it clear that I appreciate what they do because they've done more than any of us will ever hope to accomplish in our lives. I made a movie. No, but yes. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of Antonioni. I have friends who believe he's the best filmmaker ever. And I would say, however, that people like Antonioni, Fellini, uh, to some extent, is it Hitchcock in... There's a particular movie by Hitchcock, I forget the title, mm. where he is also copying, however, the Curico, as is, for example, the Italian fashion house Fendi. They are copying the Curico. And so a lot of these people 
who you are saying are trying to capture an Italian spirit, I think they're actually like many of the surrealists who are inspired by the Curico copying him. I believe, if I'm not wrong, uh, unless I'm mixing things up uh, uh, temporarily and you were actually comparing them to this, these later artists, I think on your show about my book, you said something like the Curico was trying to capture the essence of a Renaissance painter's uh, lonely plaza or something of that sort, but not quite achieving that. And I would agree with you that if you see it that way, he's not completely successful. Um, I never uh, approached the Curico in that sense. The first painting I ever saw by him was quite late. I must have been 25, 26, maybe even later, and I saw Mystery and Melancholy of a Street and um, I didn't have any cultural associations with Italy or the Renaissance or anything else. I was completely exhilarated by that. Um, I, I didn't see it as sullen. Uh, I know people do, and it's, it has those uh, associations. It's very easy to see it as something somber and sullen, but I didn't see it as that at all. I see it, saw it as something completely exhilarating. Um, I encourage uh, listeners maybe also to see his... Um, painting the the train station Montparnasse station or the nostalgia of the infinite or other such of his which are absolutely exhilarating and um, if what you were saying were true it wouldn't explain again why someone like Andre Breton would literally jump out of a moving tramway to well okay be- when I say you see something as like sullen or melancholy I mean that in a positive sense that it, it's exhilarating and life-giving yes it, because it you is, see and, you see like infinite freedom spreading before you but uh, my my issue with Takirko was always not that he captured something like sullen or pessimistic it's that he couldn't quite capture the infinite freedom and that was my beef with this book Hebdomeros that he wrote that was like a free association dream monologue that mm-hmm. you see reprised in a lot of Italian cinema actually yes I think you're right there, and Hebdomeros is not a successful effort. I, uh, if I can be a critic, I say it's not. Um, his talent was with painting, and um, there's a book by Paolo Baldacci which has very nice, big reproductions of the Curico paintings. And again, I had no idea on his philosophical intellectual background the first time I saw it, but. I was amazed to find out that he considered himself lit- a literal reincarnation of the same spirit that was inside Heraclitus and Nietzsche, and mm. that he saw his task as uh, exhibiting the real world that was imminent uh, simultaneously behind uh, this uh, the one we see before us, uh, that he saw himself as exhibiting the madness behind existence. And these are high-flown words People have to look at it and either either you're affected by it or not. Uh, but yes, it has a kind of vaporware, uh, va- vapor wave. It does. Uh, well, uh, De Kierko yeah. always, in my mind, mm-hmm. I always associated him with Blade Runner. Yes. Because mm. you said a similar thing to like how when I reread uh, Heart of Darkness, I immediately associated it with Maholan Drive. And of course, a bunch of people were like, you're a suit and you're like bat posting. But... They they both convey a very similar emotion that's like very intangible and ineffable. But yes, uh, you said in one of these essays that you wrote that the Blade Runner so called dystopia is actually a utopia of freedom and possibility. The way that yes. it's portrayed, and I always liked Blade Runner because to me it was very freeing and inspirational. When you look upon the landscapes of De Kierko, you see like the Blade Runner esque future. So in yes. that sense, I suppose he was successful. I'm so drunk no, and like fully yeah. rambling now, yeah, but yeah. you're making a lot of sense. But I think it makes sense. Uh, to me, uh, the most powerful parts of the Kiriko, if you look at some of the paintings like uh, Nostalgia of the Infinite at the tops of the fluttering flags, it captures exactly the feeling you're talking about. And it's a lot of the feeling that uh, maybe me and maybe of many of my friends uh, have been trying to recapture since, let's say, early 2010s or before, 
I don't know uh, if you can call it fully right wing. I mean, is for example, Mulholland Drive a right wing movie? What sense does it make to call that? But it's this incessant searching for a longing behind uh, what exists now and for uh, the thing that you're talking mm. about inherent in Blade Runner. I think that's uh, maybe something we seek and something that Mishima also, um, when you look at his stories, again, I encourage readers uh, maybe to look at Forbidden Colors or After the Banquet, not so much his stories about um, the samurai and so on, but his stories of um, modern Tokyo life mm. and the interjection, the surprising and shocking injection really of ancient vitality into that. Uh, that's kind of a uh, feeling that I would hope um, young uh, artists could capture. Young yes. Well, it's a feeling of, po of possibility. My beef with De Kierko is that he's fundamentally disappointing to me because he's like the Casper David Friedrich painting of the man looking over yes. the, the foggy mountain ledge. He's like edging on something profound, but he never quite reaches it. I think yes. you think he has. he's overly reliant on like... Mm, dreaminess and like whimsy maybe no no like, i like i like the dreaminess and whimsy it just it reminds me of something that this art historian called Stuart carrie welch said about armenian architecture that it's cramped and hemmed there's such a, there's something like essentially like cramped and hemmed about de Kierko's vision it almost feels to me like too try hard and he could be great if he wanted to but he doesn't quite attain it that's my fundamental like very personal very instinctual beef with him because I like him as an artist. Yes. I'm not, I'm not like a De Kierko hater. I don't have like an act of like hatred. No, and you him. may be right. And you may be right. The, there's a the exhibition now that's in New York. That's just about to end at the end of July uh, of his later paintings. All of the paintings that I'm talking about are from, let's say, up to 1925. And he had a long career after that of many paintings that fulfill exactly what you're talking about now. They're kind of trite, and he became excessively concerned with um, the techniques of color mm. creation and, uh, and, and uh, technique in painting and so on. Um, but uh, you're right about uh, maybe his later paintings especially. But look, we shouldn't talk too much about the Curico. I should go soon, no. my friends, yes, because yes, I've yes, been drinking yes. very much. But do, before we go, do you want to talk uh, br uh, just very briefly about uh, about restaurants and the fact, Anna, <laughs> that, I, the, that I recommended for your restaurant in Boston some time ago that I understand you went to, and it's, it's closed, the Hong Kong restaurant. Do you remember yeah. it? Yes, I did. I went, I went up in there. How was yes. it? It was fine. It was it was a, it was very vibey. Yes, uh, I didn't recommend it to you because it had a nice vibe, but because it had uh, some of the best traditions in at least in the United States that I knew of. Of, for example, ginger oyster hot pot and such things. And it closed because of the pandemic. And this, uh, not that I intend to return to the United States soon, but these are the kinds of things that cause me great pain. Uh, restaurants with certain good dishes that close, uh, it's a disaster. That is painful. Uh, yeah. It's It's like existentially stirring. Yeah, it's sad. Yes, yes, it's very sad. Uh, We're uh, anorexics. So. <laughs> <laughs> No, so we really do. Enjoy, we really do enjoy. When we eat, food. we really want it to count. So we need all the restaurants we can get. I, I am. Uh, I'm not anorexic, but I'm currently on a cut that causes me, as I told you at the beginning of show, psych starvation psychosis. Uh -huh. And so I, I dream of. I dream of good foods like this all the time, and uh, I don't know. Now you hear the sirens. They're coming. Yeah, they're, they're coming. Yeah. They're yeah. coming to get you. <laughs> what are the foods yes. that you dream of? Yes, I I don't know what I will dream of. I I think I have screaming nightmares of almost every <laughs> night now. I, I, I'm being haunted, but uh, yes. Okay, well, thank you so much <laughs> for coming on our show. Thank you, Val. We'll have you back again. Yes, we please. Have, we have a lot more to talk about. I hope to meet you both again. Uh, we meet Hong Kong restaurant. We have ginger oyster hot pot. This is good. Yes. We'll uh, see you and, over uh, the hot pot. <laughs> uh, 
thank you so much for having me on your show. It's a great okay. pleasure. And an we honor. love you. Yes. We we'll, love you. We'll see you in hell. Yes. See you in hell. Uh, uh,